Brake special, he slips up to the big gear. Brake's very late, his mouth wide open. He leans into that bend, he's got to come off the wheel of Lily White. That'll take some to him, but Kelly wants to do it tonight. Sean Kelly is going to come through, he's in the barriers. He's leading there, he gets it. He gets it in the most amazing sprint finish. He leads. Cycling has been everything for me. Uh, if I had stayed down in Carrick on Shore or as a farmer or as a bricklayer as I was before I became a cyclist, well, I would never be as well off financially <laughs> as I am. And, uh, you know, as well known, I've made a name for myself, I've travelled the world. <laughs> so, you know, cycling has brought me so much, uh, it's brought me everything really. Sean Kelly was the people's champion. In him, they liked to see themselves, and he earned every penny of his wealth and deserved it for the pleasure he brought millions around the world. His reputation as a hard man, unaffected by the extremes of a cruel and daunting sport, Kelly on his day could not be beaten, certainly not by the weather. Above all, his great rivals knew it. Well, Sean has something I think that any cyclist would like to have, but um, it's not very easy to have. That is so much dedication. Like Sean was dedicated uh, 12 months out of 12 months of the year, even in the winter when he went home to Ireland for, for rest, he was always uh, hooked into, into cycling. And that's probably the most, one of Sean's most outstanding characters because he was uh, dedicated in the winter as he was through the season. I think he was very strong in his head. He, he knew when he was bad, there will be, will be coming better times. And he always continued training and everything. He, it was a good, good uh, example for the, for the young riders in the team. He was really professional. He's training like a really uh, consistent in, in the track and the road and he always he has always goals to win races ambition for him he was win the races all the time that's why he was he was big big champion c'est difficile de trouver une personne de parler ma mauvais chose sur Kelly moi surtout non il est très bon souvenir de lui he is the most dedicated sportsman I've ever come across. I mean, and that ju just didn't come about during the season from March to October or so. It was through the winter as well, and right throughout the 12 months of the year, his total, utter dedication to the sport is what's kept him there for so long, got him so high in the sport, and also won him the respect of not just to the, his followers, but his fellow competitors. Qu'il n'était jamais battu, qu'il se, qu faisait toutes les courses à bloc, et dès qu'il pouvait en gagner une, il n'hésitait pas. Que ce soit de la plus petite course à la plus belle course. Euh, il faisait tout le... Et puis il avait euh, la façon de faire euh, son métier aussi, il était irréprochable. The cobbled, unforgiving Mieux de Grammont in Belgium resounded to the name of an Irishman. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. A name the world grew to quickly love and respect. This was the type of race that suited Kelly rough, tough, and a free for all. Pro cycling, though, is not for the nervous. Crashes are part of the daily routine, yet these men of single determination recover only to do it all over again. Winning is all they dream of, and Kelly was better at that than most. Fortunately, serious injury is comparatively rare, despite the competitiveness of a sport which has never commanded the high rewards of, say, a golfer, a tennis player, or those in American football. Here, Kelly catches Argentine in the last kilometre to win Milan San Remo. While behind, some end their seven-hour day as non-finishers. The races attract a huge following as riders attempt to achieve what only a few can. Narrow roads, chaos and a touch of cruelty was the order of the day during Kelly's career. This was the day Jesper Skibby showed no respect by the race officials. Kelly, though, was hard enough to survive all of this. I saw him down through the years, even when he was a junior rider, was always a man of learning. I can remember coming across here when he was 17 years of age coming across here with them. And no matter, no matter how hard the day it was, or the weight or the wind, it was down to two or three riders. Sean was always there, and the harder the better was for him. So he just pushed himself to the limit. He was always a man of iron. 
Well, I first met Sean Kelly in 1975 when uh, I organised a milk race in Great Britain. And Sean came over, it was a very young member of the Irish team, he was only 18 years of age. And uh, Pat McQuaid said to me, watch this one, he's good. And after a week, he was in third position in the milk race, which was quite out of this world because we had Olympic champions riding, the Russians were here, everybody was here. And uh, so we thought it was a flash in the pan. Four days later, he was still third in the milk race. Came to the start of the very last day, which took us to, from the north of England down to Blackpool on the promenade to the finish. And it seemed as though we were going to get a terrific surprise and Kelly was going to finish third. And um, after 20 miles of the race, Kelly was off his bike with a problem. He jumped back on it, he tried to catch them up. He had another problem, it was a brake problem the second time, punctured the first time. And he finally finished, I think it was about 10 minutes behind everybody. And everybody on the promenade was on the way home. And I thought, well, I better stay because this kid is going to be so upset. There'll be enough tears here to fill the North Sea. And uh, he's just lost everything. He, in fact, fell away from third right down to the bottom of the field. And so I waited for him. And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, oh, I'm racing tomorrow in Calic, I'm sure. It doesn't matter. And I couldn't believe it. That was the sign of a hard man and a champion. And so it's turned out to be. When he turned professional in his first year, he was hungry for success and more so for money. And that's what made it like. Now, we all like both. We all want a bit of success and we all want money. But he wanted both and he wanted them badly. I think Kelly would have been a successful cyclist even if he'd have uh, towed him out in the middle of Atlantic Ocean and told him to ride back home because it's within his body. He wants to be a success. He is afraid of no man's reputation, which is the first thing that anybody should know. I mean, he goes up against the rides of the calibre of Eddie Merckx, who was the great Belgian that won the Tour de France five times, and uh, wouldn't even notice Eddie Merckx in the race because Sean was in that race. He'd want to win it. And so his, his attitude of mind is, is and always will be right. On the days when you're not showing a good day, um, you know, it can be very painful and you can, you know, you can suffer an awful lot. Uh, and in the big races, like you always suffer, no matter how fit you are, uh, a Tour of France or a big classic race, um, you can be you know, on the top of your form, and, but you still have to suffer because you know, those races are so hard, but you know, that's, uh, the guy who can suffer most and the guy who can uh, push the pain barrier higher, but that's the guy who's, who's more successful. There is easier ways, uh, certainly, to make a living, but um, I came from you know, a background reared on a farm, and uh, it was a small farm, and, uh, on a farm, you always, you know, in them times especially, you always got, you always had your work to do. Uh, so my upbringing wasn't easy. So I think that helped me, helped me in my in my career. It helped me to, you know, to, to hang in there and to stay in there. Uh, I think, you know, if you had a very a very soft upbringing, I don't think, you know, you would be as you would be as hard. So you know, that helped me in a big way, I think. And there come three achtervolgers: Sean Kelly, Le Mont, and Adri van der Poel. Opspattend slag hier onder de wielen van de motoren en de fietsen. You know, Sean, considering the background he has come from, considering he's, he comes from a simple home in rural Ireland, uh, it's uh, exceptional the fact that he has done so as well as he has. Kelly's fitted in so well because the families in Belgium and Holland and France are people from the farms. They, they know how hard life is at the grassroots, and if the sons grow up and see a chance to break out, and to become stars and never have to work the sods like they did, then they encourage the sons. They form supporters clubs in the village. The supporters clubs have a little whip round. They all get money together and they send the son to the south of France for training and then take him to the big races in cars and look after him. Now, to a lesser degree, that's what happened to Sean Kelly because he was working on the farm and when he comes home in the winter, he loves driving the tractor. And it's my bet that the day he stopped cycling, he'll be back in, uh, in Carrick working the fields and loving every minute of it. And you still will see no signs of all the money he has. Money to Sean Kelly was the result of hard work, winning the biggest races. He deserved every penny, and from a modest background, he had found a way to earn more than anyone with a university education. He was quickly the king of the sport. While his parents, Jack and Nellie Kelly, took it all in their stride. But any thoughts that Jack had that Kelly may one day work alongside him disappeared on the training rides which led to an international career. I left school when I was about 15 and um, I went to work on the farm with my father and I worked there for a couple of months and then um, I went off and uh, I started serving my time as a bricklayer 
and uh, it was then really I took up cycling when I was about 16, between 16 and 17. Um, I had a brother who took it up before me and I just followed him a couple of weeks later with some of my friends and um, I liked the cycling. I played other sports at school like you know, Gaelic football and soccer but uh, I think the cycling it was, uh, it was something different and we were going away to races on the weekends. Uh, for example we go to the Cork and Limerick and uh, so it was getting away from the family, uh, the family farm on the weekends and getting away from the work. Well I started off with a normal bike that I had going to school. Um, and then the bike that my brother had, uh, my brother Joe, um, he got a better bike than I did, so I was handed down his one. The things I knew about cycling was maybe Ross Talton and Eddie Marx. That was about it. Uh, you know, the Ross Talton often passed the, the road where we lived and we just go to see it and be passing. And then uh, in the papers, uh, the national paper, it's, you might read four lines, Eddie Marx wins the Tour of France for the third time or the fourth time. And that was as much as I knew about cycling. And uh, when I started off, I had no, uh, I had no dream to become a professional right in the Tour of France, let's say. Um, it was just, uh, you know, I enjoyed it here, and uh, the, results, the results I was getting here, I was happy with that, and I was looking forward to riding, uh, you know, riding as a senior in this country when I started off. From the anonymous grassland of Tipperary to World Star was not a Kelly ambition, but it happened. He became only the second Irishman to wear the leader's yellow jersey in the Tour de France the only Irish winner of the Tour of Spain. In 1986, Kelly won Paris-Roubaix for a second time and he is still the only man in the world to win four green points jerseys in the legendary Tour de France. He became the world's best season-long performer in the top events. He triumphed in the World Cup when the world number one rider was him. In 1982 in Britain, he won the bronze medal in the World Championship. Another would follow later. But he had not forgotten his first racing jersey, complete with hand embroidery. As an amateur, Kelly had travelled well for Ireland, celebrating as a stage winner in the 1974 Dunlop Tour of Ireland. This was a race that brought all of the country's top riders together, and Kelly was so clearly the best of them. It gave Kelly a chance to meet the Taoiseach of the day, Charlie Hockey. Managed by former international Jim McQuaid, who was a much-loved and respected official, Kelly blossomed in the British milk race as part of an Irish team who knew what they had found. Kelly won at Sheffield's Norfolk Park, and among those he beat was the 1976 Olympic champion Bernd Johansson of Sweden. Even on grass, too, Kelly was still incorrigible. Kelly holding off Dunn. McQuaid is in third, Geary fourth. But Kelly, now Dunn coming again. But Kelly holding him off, Kelly holding him off superbly. Dunn made three attempts to get past and Kelly goes over the line now. It was as a sprinter that Kelly first earned his reputation. In Dublin's Phoenix Park, he won the last stage of the 1975 Tour of Ireland. In the milk race, he beat world champion Richard Sikorsky into second place in this sprint at Stoke-on-Trent. But his 1976 Olympic ambitions ended rather abruptly. I was on the Olympic, uh, the, Irish, the Irish Olympic squad and I went to... I went to South Africa in 75 for a race in the end of 75 and I went under a false name with some other Irish riders and some Scottish riders and were there as a, as a British team and um, it was a great opportunity for us and it was a great holiday we went out because we went out to the race and then we were allowed, it, I think it was seven or ten days holidays afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was a dream of a lifetime really for us. And uh, we were caught out there, there was uh, there was a journalist out there in English from some of the English papers and he took photographs and he sent them back to England to the Federation, to the British Cycling Federation and they said they weren't, you know, they weren't English riders, they were Irish riders and it all blew up and we were suspended from the Olympic Games for life. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton are probably the reason we were found. Oh, out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. We were in this town, I think it was called Oosthorn, and one of the stages finished there. And Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were there on their second honeymoon. It was the time he gave her that big ring that he bought for her. But, um, they naturally had a lot of gossip columns from the British papers and world papers with them at the time. And one of these uh, guys from uh, British Daily Mail, I think it was, he saw that there was this race on and in, arrived in the news tour on that day and he thought there might be a link up with uh, these two celebrities he had and a British team that was in the, in the event. So he got in touch with the organiser of the race and the organiser explained to him, no, they're in the event all right, you know, but they really shouldn't be hearing this and the other, you know. Now he's a South African journalist and he, he understood the situation and he should have realised but instead he got out the following day with his telephoto lens and so forth, wired the pictures back to London. Suspension from the Games followed, did Sean regret missing the Olympics? 
Um, well, I can't say value, but I do regret it. Um, it would have been nice to compete in the Olympics, but then again, if I had done well and you know made a good place in the Olympics, I might have waited for another four years to have another go at it, and that would have, you know have messed up my career as a profession, and I might never been a profession. So for those reasons, you know, yeah, it would have been nice to you know to go to the Olympics, but then again, uh, you know, it might it might have kept me away from professional cycling altogether. We all benefited from Kelly's enforced professionalism, which he himself owed to one man, Count Jean de Gribaldi, who wanted no one else but Kelly. He'd impressed him that much. 76, um, when, we were, when we were out of the Olympic Games, I decided to go to France because I had met people from a club in France uh, in Metz in 75 at the Tour of Britain Milk Race. And they said, if I'd ever like to come to, uh, to France to race, that I'd be always welcome to that club. And that just made a decision for me. When I wasn't going to the Olympics, I didn't want to stay here. Well, when I went to Metz, I won quite a lot of races, and I won the Tour of Lombardy amateur uh, with the team. We went down to, to Italy to race quite a lot. And uh, before I came back to Ireland uh, in the year of 75, um, I was had some phone calls from a man called Sean de Garibaldi, asked me if I'd be interested in becoming professional. And I said no, that I was too young, and I had kind of planned to go back to the club for the, for the following year. And that was okay. The season finished, and I came back here to Ireland. And uh, one one December day, I was out driving, um, driving one of my brother's tractors, and uh, I was actually coming from Carrick and Shure, and this taxi pulled up, and there was three people got out of the taxi, and I didn't, I hadn't, I hadn't met to Gabaldi. I just spoke to him on the phone, and uh, he had an interpreter with him, and he started speaking, and he said, you know, this is Mr. Gabaldi. He wants you to sign a professional contract for the year of '76. And I said, well, you know, follow me back home. And they did that, and we talked for quite a long time, you know, certainly two hours. And he left me with a contract, and he said that, you know, I was going to one of the best teams, Flandria, which was with Freddie Martins, one of the best teams in the world at that moment. And But uh, he also told me that there was a team where there was a lot of new professionals like myself, and I wouldn't, I would not have to make all the big races. Uh, we'd have a lot of small races, second category races to ride in the first year. And that was really you know, swung the decision for me and I held the contract maybe for three or four weeks and, you know, he was ringing quite often and then I sent it back eventually. I didn't know anything about cycling, professional cycling, I certainly knew very, very little. Um, so I talked with some people here and they said, some people said, yes, go take your chance and other people said, no, hold on for another year. And, uh, you know, there was a few problems because if you came, if you became professional and you, you didn't work out in your first year and you want to go back as amateur to be reinstated, you'd have to, have, uh, you have to wait 12 months before you could be reinstated as an amateur, where that regulation doesn't exist now. So there was quite a few snags there, and uh, you know when I was looking at all of those, but eventually I said, well, uh, I'll take the chance and I'll go for it. Kelly joined Flandre in 1977, riding alongside Freddie Mertens, a man he came to respect of of most, and he rapidly broke into the rough professional peloton. Second in the Tour of Holland, 16th in the world title, he was an instant success. Jean de Gabraldi had been right. He had seen a very special person on a bike, and success was only a wheel turn away for the bricklayer from Ireland. The next year, he was in the Tour de France with Flandria. So the teammates of the Flandria team working very hard now. They're controlling this race, keeping the pace high, and the object is so there can be no sudden attacks. And by doing this, they're riding along at about 27 miles an hour just at the moment. And a surprise entry, but one we'll look out for soon is Sean Kelly of Ireland. This great, tough Irishman from carrick on -Sure. That's Henk Luberding passing out of the picture, the new champion of Holland. And Sean Kelly, a tremendous shot of Sean Kelly, the Irishman on the left. He's looking for his team leader in second position, Freddie Martins. And we're coming up to the finish now. Will Jan Ross in the yellow jersey win it? Will Freddie Mertens or will it be Sean Kelly right there too at the front of the field? It's Walter Plankard of Belgium has stolen it from Freddie Martins on the line. And it could have been Sean Kelly in third place. But Jan Ross will at the time Kelly turned pro, so too did British rider Paul Sherwin. And he recalled the day the riders went on strike in their first Tour de France at Valen d'Argent. Well, actually, we were on the second round. It was quite funny. All the big stars of the Tour de France, Freddie Mertens, Bernardino, they were at the front. They were the ones that decided that day there was going to be a strike because there's just been so many transfers. And Kelly and I were in the second row, and it was our first Tour de France. Kelly came alongside me, and he says, don't trust anybody. He says, if anyone moves, we go for it. <laughs> 
The following year, Kelly was in the colours of Splendor, but it was basically the same team that Flandria had been, and 1978 saw him continue to progress with a stage win in the Tour de France. He would go on to win four more. But although Kelly won many stage races, he was seen as an outstanding single-day classics rider. In an event once known as the Race of the Falling Leaves, the Tour of Lombardy in the autumn, he won this three times. The Hell of the North race, Paris-Roubaix, he took twice. In the Belgian Ardennes, the Liège Baston Liège, he won twice as well. The Paris Tours, a race for the sprinters, he won in 1984 when he was very quick. The longest of them all, Milan San Remo, he won twice. Then there was the Grand Prix de Nation and Gemp Wevelgem in Belgium. I think I started to realize the classics and to know about the classics and learn about them was in 76. Um, that was the first year I started, started reading the magazines, uh, the cycling magazines, a lot of the English magazines, and then I got to know about the races. Uh, you know, the Paris Roubaix, it was all those roads, the cobblestones, and it was the roads that the farmers really used to go to their fields. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Milan San Remo's and the Tour of Flanders and Lille Baston Liège. And, uh, you know, it was just the just year before I came professional, really, that I learned about them. I, as a kid of eight or ten years of age, I didn't know anything about those events whatsoever. The Italians soon knew about Sean Kelly, though, as he headed for his first classic win in the Tour of Lombardy in 1983. The classics still are the backbone of the sport, and to win just one is the dream of many riders. Here, Kelly uses his famous sprint to hold off the day's finest finishes. He'd taken the first step to becoming one of the world's best riders. My first classic win would have been the Tour of Lombardy, and uh, I can remember that quite well. Um, I was actually fighting for the Super Prestige, which is the classement for the, uh, all the classics, and it was also included in some of the big tours. It was a classic race of the season, and I was up in the classement. It was uh, with Greg Lamond. He was leading, and actually, you know, if if I won the race and he wasn't in the first three or four, um, I would have won the Super Prestige. And we arrived in the sprint, and I remember I won the sprint by by about a tire from Lamond. This the beginning of the short descent now down towards the line on the shores of Lake Como, and Munas has gone something like 12 seconds clear of the group. Well, he's looking there a little bit wet. The weather's drying up nicely now, and this is the chasing group. And at the back here, the former amateur world champion, Gilbert Glaus of Switzerland, and also in this leading group, Sean Kelly of Ireland, and his countryman, Stephen Roach, and the newly crowned world champion, Greg Lamond of the United States. So the classic going the way of the English-speaking riders once again. This is Stephen Roach. He's had a marvellous day. He's been setting the pace throughout the 153 miles. And now Munoz looks over his shoulder here. He really should get on with the job in hand rather than concern himself now. The race is right here where Munoz is, not behind him. This is now the chasing group. Number nine is Henny Kuiper, winner of Paris-Roubaix earlier this year. And the counter-attack's beginning to move smoothly off the front. Sean Kelly is also in this group. And you might catch a glimpse of him. He's wearing an orange jersey. In fact, that's Kelly now looking round near the front of the group, checking to see who exactly is still remaining after what has been a long day in the saddle. And now this final classic is looking to me as though it could well be going the way of this Spanish rider. He's burying his head now and he's trying desperately to survive. He can't find a bigger gear on the machine. He's in the highest gear he has and they're all coming back. So the group is almost on Monez now and this is going to put Sean Kelly in with a chance of that first ever classic victory. Stephen Roach in second place here. Kelly, that orange jersey, never far from the front. Fourth or fifth place. And Greg Lamont, too, a good sprinter and without doubt the find of the 1983 season. Well, Francesca Moser, the hopes for the Italians here in this group. Cerrone, the great disappointment again, missing out in a major event. Uh, the winner this year of Milan San Remo, and now some four minutes behind this group. And the front runners now, Ferretti is leading the riders in through the very twisty back street approach to the line. Kelly, so cautious, so clever, lying there in fourth slot, waiting for the sprint to begin. A hand on the short third applied by Gilbert Klaus of Switzerland. So the fight for the front position is beginning now as the riders make the right-hand turn. Kuiper goes into the corner first. 
Henny Kuiper now coming to lead out for the finish. Kuiper looks over his shoulder, now starts to sprint for home. Just behind him is Ferretti, and then on his right there, the orange jersey of Kelly begins to make the sprint. Francesco Mosa in white, tucked in behind Kuiper. Mosa now comes forward in the white jersey. Kelly in the centre, Le Mans joins Kelly on his shoulder, hits the line. And that's a photo finish between Sean Kelly and Greg Le Mans of the United States. And what a sprint it was. And we can see it here now in slow motion. Kuiper sets up nicely for everybody else because he really is no sprinter. Then Kelly starts the sprint in the centre of the picture. But look at the acceleration of Le Mans there as Kuiper moves away to the right. Le Mans bursts through. And the two stars of 1983 bring the classic season to the end with Sean Kelly first and Le Mans second. It gives you a lot of confidence and you know, you're much more relaxed for the following months. And you know, when you go into those classics and you can be a bit more relaxed, well then that's, that's the time you can win, win them easier. And uh, I think the confidence boost when you have won one, well then you can go on and you know, uh, you have the ability to win. It's just that uh, if you might lack the, lack the confidence until you get the first win. But when you get the win, and many of course never will, the feeling you can go out and do it all again comes as well. Kelly was a winner, losing was never in his makeup. The great Italian Francesco Moser won Milan San Remo in 1984. But in the sprint for second place, Kelly's tail was up again. Now he was winning sprints with comparative ease. But there was one classic which was different, universally known as the Hell of the North, it was Paris Roubaix. I remember my first Paris Roubaix, that I think it was 80 or 81, and um, I fell off about three times. Uh, I couldn't stay upright on the cobblestones. Paris Roubaix is the best classic to win, um, but you know it's a very difficult one because uh, over the cobblestones and 45 kilometres of cobblestones, and you know it's people don't realise what the cobblestones are like because there's some there's some potholes there which you know are big enough to get to get lost in because the, the roads, a lot of them which are used by the farmers to get to the fields. And um, everybody, everybody l would love to win a Paris Roubaix, but not everybody dream about it because I think it's, it's not possible because you have to be able to ride across the cobblestones and there's so much um, look attached. You know, you have to be very lucky on the day and not have mechanical problems. But the first big thing is you have to be capable of riding uh, over the cobblestones that distance. And you know, the number of professionals able to do that is not as, there's not as many, for example, as say, people who could win a Milan San Remo or a, a Liege Bastogne Liege. There's much more guys capable of winning those races than they are of a Paris Roubaix.
Kelly had won Paris-Roubaix, now even the French would recognize him. In Belgium, Kelly had found a second life and he was a big part of the Nice family. Here, second mum, Madame Nice, holds up a sock from Paris-Roubaix. 84, I think, would be the best. Um, you know, in the classics, I was really, um, I was really riding, uh, you know, at my best. And um, I was also riding other events in between, for example, the Tour of Pays Basque and those races. And, you know, I was, I was winning. I was in the first three of all those events. 1984 was a great year for him. Here, he added liege Baston liege to his growing list, and by the end of the year, he would have notched an incredible 32 wins. This sprint was a cheeky one, as Kelly toyed with Phil Anderson from Australia and Greg LeMond from America. The winter spent training, Kelly rode 160 races in 1984. Was he riding too many now? Yes, it's, uh, it's more than normal. The, for the normal professional rider, it's around 120, 130 races. I think I did, I rode a, f uh, a bit much, a bit too many, and uh, out of that I won 32 races. I was winning races right through the season. Um, so when you, win, when you win the race all the time, while well, the morale is very, very high, it's when, uh, if you're recovering from sickness or you're, you're going through a bad period, which, which happens with a lot of riders, you, you're not in, not in form all the year. And uh, they are the moments when you're off form and things are not going right in the races, you, you know. The morale is down and there's, there's days you don't want to go training and there's days you don't want to race. In 1984, Kelly won the Super Prestige Trophy and would win it again in the following two years. In 1985, the Tour of Lombardy was again a target. My second Tour of Lombardy, um, again, you know, when you've won, when you've won a classic or two, it, you know, it comes more easy and you have a bit more confidence in yourself. And uh, my second one was... Uh, we arrived on the track actually in Milan and um, again I was going for the super prestige and actually Phil Anderson was leading and uh, he had to finish, he had to finish up in the places, uh, if, I, if I won the event he had to be in the first, in the first ten and, or the first eight, I'm not quite sure. The odds were against him winning the super prestige for the second year in succession. Kelly had to win and hope that Phil Anderson stayed out of the top ten. This was an award for the year's most consistent all-rounder in the world's best events. Kelly was certainly that in the early 80s. And so now Sean Kelly is in this leading group and will be somewhat relieved that Phil Anderson has retired from the race. So Kelly knows now he's peddling to the second successive a Super Prestige trophy. And he's in a breakaway yet again in a big classic race. He has been outstanding today, attacking almost from the start. Little Charlie Motte of France on the Renault team is in this breakaway as well and riding equally as strongly. Croker Killian, a friend of Kelly, passes through in the Itachi colours on the left. Giuseppe Cerrone, also a member of the breakaway. Well, this has been a remarkable event and Kelly has come out with such determination today from the minute he left the start at Lake Como, he made it quite clear he wasn't going to lose the trophy he won for the first time a year ago. He doesn't need to win the Tour of Lombardy anymore to take that trophy. Now he simply needs to finish in this leading group. Anderson has retired. And the finish will suit Kelly too. They're coming into the stadium and onto the track at the Vigarelli, the boards of the Vigarelli track, and that's where they're approaching now. Mark Maddio is leading out, Clorca Killion is in second place, little, little Charlie Motte is in third place, Kelly's got his wheel, Kelly seems to have figured that Motte is the man to follow here. Through the narrow entry, the riders in a long straight line, they'll now see the track and it's very steep boards. You know, for a road racing cyclist who doesn't race on the track, this can be a very nervous finish indeed. But Kelly loves it when they're nervous. Look at him go now. Moves over the top of them, following the wheel of Charlie Motte. Motte is going to tow Kelly, but Kelly will have the sprint to beat him. Motte is not like as quick as Sean Kelly in a finish like this. Adri van der Poel is coming up. Van der Poel is coming up with great speed, has closed the gap to the wheel of Kelly, who's gone wide. Kelly is going to win the Tour of Lombardy and take the Super Prestige trophy. A superb finish by Sean Kelly. Van der Poel will get second. Charlie Motte third. Marina Lacheretta is the rider who finishes in fourth place. And for him, that's a great performance on this track. Sean Kelly takes the final accolade of the season, the Tour of Lombardy, and with it, the trophy.
So Kelly got the Lombardia Trophy for a second time and won the Super Prestige Trophy as well. The season was over, but the next one would start also in Italy with the classic Milan to San Remo. Well, Milan San Remo is um, it's the first uh, big classic of the season, and you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest with the media and uh, the riders, the teams. You know are very nervous if you can win Milan San Remo, well then your season is made, and. Uh, the Italian teams are definitely, um, you know, they are crazy for Milan San Remo. If you win Milan San Remo, well, then you can sit back in the armchair for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I won uh, my first Milan San Remo. I remember I arrived with Le Monde. Uh, Le Monde escaped from the Poggio just before the finish, and he was with a rider called Beccia. And uh, I came, I was in a group behind with, you know, a group Van der Arden and Moser, and I left them, and I caught him just before the top. And, I arrived in the sprint with, uh, with, with the two guys and I beat him quite easy in the sprint. And, uh, you know, it, when you, when you it was my first Milan San Remo and it gives, you know, it's a great feeling. Uh, maybe you don't really show it when you cross the line, you know, you just, the normal thing, you put your hands up, uh, part of the sponsorship, you get a sponsorship exposed well. But I think the feeling within is something that uh, for the days after the event, that's, you know, that's where the, you get the real pleasure from it. The Italians were getting used to Kelly taking their awards and the 77th Milan San Remo was his after he beat Greg Lamond. A month later, Kelly was back in France and showed the rest a clean, well, perhaps not so clean, pair of wheels in Paris-Roubaix. The queen of the classics, as it was known, was looking at her king no again. Doubt. It's a fantastic performance of Kelly's, and indeed from the other three here in Pyro Bay. Every one of them deserves to win it. They've all put up a fantastic performance, and every one of them is a winner in actual fact. John Jane Kelly, second last week at Tour of Flanders, winner of the Tour of the Basque Country. Up here, he's certainly going to be fourth at worst this week in the Paris Roubaix. The remarkable man who never seems to rest that body of his, that those legs of his and what a tough chore it is for him. But it is, of course, the same for them all. But remember, he's defending the prestige Perno, which he won in 84 and 85, and that is regarded by many professional cyclists as a greater honor than the world championship itself, which, is, of course, is just one day. And there's the arrow. There's the kite, one kilometer into the final kilometer now, and Danen's having a go now. Danen's attacking, Van der Poel going after him, Kelly on his wheel, and Freddy Vandenhout still the fourth, and to my mind, the danger man at the back. So, Kelly in the yellow, distinguishable, the yellow of Kelly, the white of Vandenhout, and Kelly realizes perhaps now that Vandenhout really is, as Pat McQuaid says, the danger. Can Danen snake away? Van der Poel realizes that as a possibility. Van den Hout thinking about another attack. One, two, three, go. Van, Van den Hout went on the blind side and Van der Poel was looking the wrong way. Now Van der Poel chasing him, taking up the chase. This is very good for Kelly. Yes, it's Van den Hout from Van der Poel. Kelly and Van der Poel's wheel. Denens in fourth place. Has Denens anything left? Kelly looks perfectly positioned. Has a look for Denens. Kelly takes it. Oh, one split second of power. Leaves great men vanquished. Kelly comes away. That's a marvellous win for Sean Kelly. A marvellous win. Beautifully timed. Denens is second. Van der Poel is third. Well, when you're a superstar, as is Kelly, the fuss and the adulation are part of the scene. And it's no difference here on the street in Roubaix in April 1986, making his way to the column, the tears of television and radio commentators. Uh, interview there with some of the riders who finished behind Kelly. Jimmy McGee was the first with the news as Kelly beat Rudy Darlins and Adri van der Poel. This was the richest race of the time, with a £15,000 prize, and Kelly had claimed it. He was having another dream season, and the newspapers throughout the world gave him the space he deserved. At his adopted home in Vilbort, Belgium, the Nice family had hoisted the Irish tricolour, and the fans had given him the treatment. Any shortage of white paint around Brussels airport could be blamed on Kelly's supporters. The Paris Bay is the classic to win, so the day after, the interviews followed, and Kelly was speaking to Belgian television. The last, the last 40, 40 kilometers were quite a big group together, uh, which is not normal for a Paris Roubaix because... How do you explain that? Uh, how do I explain it? Uh, well, first of all, yesterday, the, the stones... At the start of the race, I thought it would be very, very... It would be a very, very hard Paris Roubaix, a very 
a very slippery and very muddy parish would be. But yesterday the stones, they weren't, they weren't as much mud as, as other years. And uh, I think that was, that was one of the reasons because a lot of riders, a lot of riders, they stayed together because there weren't as much crashes. But and there was no moment of panic? Uh, well, not, not, a, not great panic, but yes, when I see it, 30 kilometers to go, I see there was a, quite a big group and a lot of, a lot of good sprinters. For example, Fruller, uh, Van der Raven, uh, I think he was with, and uh, also Plankert. And uh, I said, if, it, if, it goes, if we keep together like that to finish, well, then it's going to be, it's going to be dangerous. But uh, yeah, looking back on other years, it's always the last couple of, couple of sector of cobbles that do the damage. And I think it's always there to break up. Last year, Mario, he got away in the same sector where, where, where we also got away yesterday. So, yeah, I said to, I was just thinking, I was saying to myself, yes, I must, I must make the, I must start making a tempo on the cobbles, try and attack and try to, try to break up the group. And uh, on the next sector, on the next, on the next sector of covers, it was Van der Poel who 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 goes the front and he ride very hard. And then uh, halfway through that sector, he he moved over. On, and then I, I he said to me he he said to me come through. And I went through and I rode very hard. And we came out to the other end. There were only four riders. And yes, at that at that moment, then I started to ride, and every the other three also rode. And yeah, that was I said to myself, now is it's the chance to, the chance to win the race. Do you agree with people saying you are racing too much? Uh, no, I don't. I don't agree with that. Uh, a lot of people say yes, you race too much because I made the Tour of Flanders and then immediately I went to the Tour of Pay Basque. But uh, for me, I think the Tour of Pay Basque was the best, the best preparation because uh, yeah, if I stayed here and rode against Weaver, against Weaver again, well then I would be I would have to train every day and I wouldn't have the I wouldn't have the same life as I had in the Tour of Pay Bass because there I just rode my bike, I eat and I slept. And uh, I think it was, for me it was the best preparation because when I'm at home I'm, I'm always at the house, I'm always doing something. I can't, I can't stay, st stay still during the day. I'm always working at something, doing something in the garage. And you know, you're always, you're always going, walking about and it's not, it's not good for you. But you are uh, still there from uh, the beginning of the season till the end in classics, in tours. Uh. Yes. Uh, yeah, I seem, to, I seem to I seem to get through the season much better than other riders. Other riders after after two months, three months, they seem to think that they have uh, that they have raced too much and they need to rest. But I think I think a lot of the problem is that it's the people it's the people around them that say you race too much. Maybe their supporters and this they say yes, oh, you race too much, you're going to be tired. You better take it easy. And uh, yeah, they get into their head they're tired, uh, and then uh, but uh, physically they're not tired, but. But, but, but with people saying to them all the time, well then, you know, if you if you have something in your head, it's the same. If you, if you have the morale to race, well then you can't you can't race, but it's just the same. Where do you find this uh, force, the the mental power to do so? Uh, well, I don't I don't I don't have to find it. It's something I have got. I think. A sportsman alone in any country needs special friends, and Kelly found them in the Nice family, who gave him a home from home. They were of enormous importance to me. I think, um, you know, getting getting in in the professional scene and getting set in. Uh, but I think that was, you know, that was the making of me, and it was a very important moment as well. Uh, to, you know, to get in there, get settled in, get to know the ropes, get to learn the game, and you know, living there, I think that was very important. When I went to Belgium, um, I, most, I first met Hamlin Elise when I went to the 75 World Championships in Mete in Belgium as an amateur on the Irish team. And uh, they said to me if I was ever coming to Belgium and wanted to stay with them, I'd be always welcome. And um, when I became professional in 77, I went to France. And then 78, I came to Belgium for a while and I stayed there. And 79, I went to live with, the, with Hamlin and Elise. And I lived with them a number of years before I got married. And, they were like another mother and father to me. And it was a perfect situation. You know, when you go away to race, you come back to a house where there's somebody living. If you live in an apartment, well, then the thing is closed up and there's no food in. And it's, you know, the lifestyle is much more difficult. Where, uh, you know, in that situation for me, it was the perfect situation. And I was like a son to them. And they gave me, this, they gave me the support the same as I was, I was their son. Yeah.
porte l'équipier de Chop Kelly dans son maillot de euh, gaz qui tente. Et ici derrière, Chop euh, Kelly. On passe de Wekmuller à Kelly, il ne faut pas comprendre. Chop Kelly qui tente de lancer la contre-offensive. Euh, euh, je répète qu'il a été victime d'une chute, qu'il a cassé son cadre et qu'il est revenu. Mais il n'a pas perdu finalement trop de temps. Donc Chop Kelly en contre-offensive. Et il a dans sa roue un équipier de Van Oudon, que je ne crois pas qu'il relaie. C'est lui le Peter qui est dans la roue de Sean Kelly. Donc Sean Kelly qui tente de lancer la contre-attaque, mais on peut, je crois, je crains. And Kelly comes out of it with a badly gashed left elbow, as you can see. Yes, it's a tough way to earn a living. The three leaders, Michel Dernis of the Lotto team, Adri van der Poel of PDM and Robert Miller of Fagor. Uh, in the last kilometer now, these riders have been away for about uh, 50 odd kilometers now, and it's Miller leading out the sprint. And just behind them is Stephen Rooks, but he's not going to be involved in the sprint. It's van der Poel, Dernier and Robert Miller, but the Dutch champion van der Poel takes it. Derny is second and Robert Miller is third. Stephen Rooks got fourth and this is a sprint for fifth position and Sean Kelly takes that. It's an ideal situation for Sean Kelly because unlike the other weeks we've seen him in the classics this year, he hasn't had two and three and sometimes four men marking. It's every man for himself and it's in all of their interest that they keep the pace up because the bunch isn't all that far behind. And there's the kite with 1K to go. Kerkelion from Peters from Kelly. Bugno just out of picture on Kelly's wheel. Kelly now we can see uh, taking up the, the, the lead now and staying at the front now and leading out this sprint now. And the last whole last kilometer, Kerkelion looks to be just uh, just going for it. He knows he's not going to win. He's just going to lead out the sprint and possibly uh, and probably I'd, I would say even for Kelly at this stage, they're very close friends. And Kerkelion would like to see Kelly get that classic he so uh, so badly deserves. So Sean Kelly with Bugno on Kelly's wheel, and no doubt Bugno knows where the real danger is, but Kelly's looking up ahead. You'll see him checking back behind just to get the shadow of Bugno. See there again. So those two, certainly the favourites, and Kukilin giving a very good lead out here. And into the sprint. Kelly and Bugno going for it. Kelly taking it up now, and here comes the strength of the big man. And Kelly has a quick check to his left. He's won the classic. Gent Vivelgem has been won by Sean Kelly. He looked very strong, very strong indeed. Bugno was second. And Herman Nice there with the green Irish cap just on Kelly's left shoulder. The faithful Herman Nice always close by to look after Sean Kelly. Kelly moved to the Dutch PDM team, spending the early season winter training in Austria, where his strength was also apparent on skis. He had such an appetite for competition, and he was an accomplished skier. Kelly had moved to PDM, and soon afterwards a major success followed in the 1989 Liège-Baston-Liège. Liège. This was a big return to form for Sean Kelly. With the new PDM team, he'd refound his old confidence. He was about to end the long drought since winning a race. Kelly was in a leading group with Fabrice Filippo riding for Toshiba. Phil Anderson, again of Australia and riding for TVM, was also here. Anderson was, if anything, the big favourite. But then Pedro Delgado launched an attack. Delgado had said this was to be his most important race of this season, and he was determined to win it. Kelly had other ideas. They recaught Delgado, who had split the front group. They were now across all of the big hills. They were now heading down into the finish in the centre of Liège. Delgado was at the back now. He knew his last chance had gone when he couldn't break away on the final hills. Kelly now knew, though, he had a big sprinter in Phil Anderson to beat, and Fabrice Filippo, a Frenchman, was on a high. These were nervous moments because the remnants of the breakaway were not very far behind. In fact, only a matter of seconds. This 268-kilometre World Cup event could come down to a big sprint yet. Rudy Darnens, Laurent Fignon, Stéphane Rooks, Miguel Indurain were all chasing behind, while the four at the front diced for the final result. 
Well, I knew if I got to the finish uh, with the, with three other riders, I knew I had a very good chance in, chance in the sprint. Uh, but the problem is, if you get a long ways ahead, you get a minute and a half or two minutes ahead of the, the, the group of riders, which is about 30 or 35 hours behind us, well, then the guys started, started attacking. So that was something that wasn't going to suit me because if it started attacking, well, everybody was going to look around to me and let me do all the chasing. So by not being very far ahead, uh, there was no time to attack, and it was perfect the way it worked out in the final. And uh, the other side was that I had Rooks and Tunison in the, in the group behind. I knew they were there, and maybe uh, possibly another rider from PDM. So I, I said to the other riders, well, if we don't work together, well, then we're going to be caught and we're going to lose everything. And that was, uh, that was what I said to the guys at the, t the top of the last hill, which about, I think, 8 kilometres, 10 kilometres before the finish. No. And so it came down to what would be a sprint finish as they raced down into the city of Liège. It was now could Sean Kelly produce the finishing sprint that would win him this great race. Phil Anderson, the TVM on the left, one and a half kilometres to go. Fabrice Filippo behind him. Sean Kelly, number 14, it was right there. Into the streets, Kelly had taken fourth position. Anderson was worried about him. He knew the power of Sean Kelly once Kelly saw the finishing line. Pedro Delgado setting the pace, the non-sprinter. He'd lost his chance by not breaking clear in the hills. He'd tried, but he'd failed. Delgado slipped back. Kelly maintained number four wheel. Anderson was worried not only about Sean Kelly, but by the fast approaching chasing group behind, which were in fact now a matter of seconds. And there they were. This was an important ride for Kelly, his new sponsors, he wanted the big win. Anderson hit the front early, Kelly gratefully took second wheel. Delgado was now out of it, Filippo though had to be watched. Then they lined up for the finish, Sean Kelly on the left of our picture, went smoothly through the inside of Anderson and came quite clear of the field. Filippo just holding the revs got second, but Kelly had got his big win yet again. By 1990, Kelly had been a professional for 13 years when I spoke to him in Austria at Zellumsee. Already he'd been at the top longer than most, but clearly was still enjoying it. Was retirement now looming? Sean, 10 years ago, 1980 was beginning, you'd been a pro a couple of years, people were talking about you then as the up-and-coming superstar. And they were absolutely right. What's going to happen now we're going into the 90s? Obviously retirement will come at some stage this decade, but you're not thinking of retiring right now, are you? No, not thinking of retiring right now. Um, hopefully after this year that I'll be able to do another, I'd like to do another year, maybe two. But mm. I think after this year, two years more would be my maximum. And, uh, well, I can't give myself, I can't keep myself, um, like, s another three years and that's going to be it. Now you have the ultimate respect of the professional riders and they are the best judge of their own rivals. They all respect you because you never seem to be affected by illness or injury or the weather, or bad morale. Now, is that your secret of success? Well, I think that's been uh, a lot of my success. Um, weather and, uh, you know, when, the, when I'm on, uh, on an off time in, during the year, for example, you know, you go through times where the form is not very good, and I don't, um, I don't moan about it a lot, I think. That's the problem with a lot of riders at the very minute, they, you know, they're on off, sh uh, and off, of, off form, well, uh, they just lose the morale, and you know they they just stop training. That is the problem when you're you know when you're not in a good going through a good patch. Uh, you, you know they lose out on that training. I think that's yeah. that's the time when you when you really have to work on it more and get back get back again to top. Cycling was the earner, but the twins expected by wife Linda were their life now, and this was far more important at Shea Kelly than another win in Milan San Remo. I won't have really a big act in it. <laughs> uh, my job is done. <laughs> um, it's going to be more difficult for Linda because, uh, first of all, as a profession, you're away so much, and uh, normally it's for uh, the third of March. So uh, you know, I don't know where I will be at that moment. Uh, but um, you know, it will be, it will be, it will change our lifestyle a lot because, first of all, you can't go away uh, whenever you like. And for Linda, more so, she, you know, she came a lot to the races. For example, the race in Belgium and. 
uh, she would have travelled a, a lot more before. She was more free. Well, now it's, it, it won't be the same situation. But, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to it, and she uh, much more so. Nigel and Stacey arrived, and, like it or not, they were already part of Dad's team. This was an event Kelly was very happy to take forth in, as the stage went first to babies and then to Linda as the children were baptised. And why was Ireland chosen instead of Belgium for the christening? Well, uh, Linda wanted to have the babies here because all our families here, all, both of our families are all here. And secondly, uh, we're both Irish. Happy moments, though, quickly disappeared as a return to the battlefields of classic riding resulted in a bad fall in the 1990 Tour of Flanders, a race Sean always wanted to win but finished second in three times. He broke his collarbone, so the kids got to know Dad a bit better. An unexpected chance to learn about being a father as well as a bike rider. Kelly would recover as his rivals always knew because he was such a professional. Well, I've, you know, I've put a lot of work into it. Um, I think um, you know, I'm one of the riders who will really work hard at it. Uh, maybe I'm not a rider with, uh, with a, a huge amount of class. I have you know, a certain amount, but I work very hard uh, to uh, to stay up there, and over the past years, uh, you know, as you get older, you have, you, have to, you have to work harder again, and uh, it's probably for one of those reasons uh, that you know the other riders look up to me and say, well, he's you know one of the one of the professionals who was uh, you know who was, who was, who really lives the li life of a, as a of a professional. For uh, for the classic races at the moment, there's not great rivalry in the team. Um, some of the riders uh, that we had last year, there was a change about, or some have left. So I'm really, uh, you know, the leader, or you know, one of the, one of the leaders for the uh, for the classic races. But in 1991, he was back home again in mid-season with another broken collarbone in Paris Nice, a race he had won a record seven times straight. He was getting used to holding the children. But although the season may have started badly, it would end on a high note. The mighty Sean was not relinquishing his crown yet, and the Tour of Lombardy would be his for a third time. In the race of the falling leaves, Kelly was with a Frenchman, Marshal Gaillon. The pair were clear, and Gaillon, little known as a sprinter, was never going to be a match for the Irishman. Just for a change, here's how the name Kelly sounds in Italian. <laughs> Ecco ancora Marshal Gaillan, vediamo se ora Marshal Gaillan lancia lo sprint, il francese è scattato, siamo ormai ai 150 metri, esce alla grande Kelly, vince nettamente come era prevedibile, Kelly terzo sigillo sul giro di Lombardia. This win proved, even to him, there were still a couple of seasons left in those talented legs, and in 1992 he would again show the world that he just couldn't stop winning. My last one was uh, was the one which gave me an enormous amount of pleasure, probably as much as my first classic win. Um, the reason I wasn't a favour for the event, um, and um, you know, leading up to the event, I hadn't been riding that strong, but I felt quite, I felt quite well in the, in the Torino. The Vatican was riding very strong, and I felt myself um, that I had a good chance, and I was feeling very good. But I didn't show my cards uh, as I had probably, you know, in other years where I was riding everything to try and win before, even before the classics. And we went to Milan San Remo, and I felt very, very strong in the end. And on the Poggio, Argentina was riding so strong that year. In Torino, Adratico, he was just miles ahead of everybody else, and we had one or two mountain top finishes, and he just left everybody dead and just rode away from them. And when we got to the Poggio, he started, you know, doing the same thing as he had been doing in the Torino, Adratico, and he started attacking. He was just, you know, he was blowing the thing to pieces. And I, I decided on the Poggio, I was going to take a position, in, you know, eight or ten position, and just sit there, and you know, leave it somebody else to do the chasing, and I did that. Kelly was right to fear Moreno Argentin because as soon as the Poggio climb started, Argentin was straight to the front. 
he was very, very confident. He knew he was the strongest man on the pro circuit at this time on this year. Moreno Argentin was confident enough to ride at the front of the peloton as the slopes climbed a little bit steeper, inch by inch. The climb itself is three kilometers long. Moreno Argentin knows that to win Milan San Remo, this is where you make your move. Slowly, he opened the gap at the front, and then he launched a very, very strong attack. Moreno Argentin had thrown down the gauntlet, blasting off the back wheel, none other than Laurent Jalabert. He was now heading for victory, alone on the last climb of Milan San Remo. And I came over the Paul Jones with a group of about, I think, about eight or ten behind, and Argentine, I think, at 13 seconds over the top, and I decided I was going to go for it on the descent. And uh, you know, I said, well, that, you know, at least I'll be going for second place if I don't catch him, and I just took after him, and I just, you know, took. Started taking risks at the beginning. Second place for Sean Kelly. He would never even dream of it. Yet Moreno Argentine had started the long drop down towards the finishing line. Sean Kelly just had to do something about it and do something about it quickly. As I was going down, I could see I was closing very, very rapid on him, and I just, you know, I gave it everything and took all the risks. With all of Europe watching on television these live pictures, Sean Kelly made the descent of his life, simply riding the rest of Milan San Remo off his wheel. You know, when you look at the descent of the Foggio, if you miss a corner, well, you know, there's, there's, there's the walls uh, which are, you know, eight or ten foot high. There's no place to run off uh, where you can slow down a bit. You just go straight into the wall. And, you know, when you look at that, and, and it always looks more dangerous on TV when you look at any of those events later, but I definitely said, you know, after that event, well, you know, I took... Uh, I was just, you know, a bit crazy, really, and... But it worked out, and you win a plastic, like, a Milan San Remo, and you say to yourself, well, you know... Uh, you do it all again. If you're in the event, you don't, start you don't think about the danger. You just think about catching the guy and you think about winning and uh, you know, you're concentrating on what you're doing. You don't, you never, the danger never really comes into it until, you know, until you're going you know, to be stuck in the, in the bottom of the wall. A look over his shoulder. Moreno Argentine thought he was going to win Milan San Remo. He was now heading for the final kilometre. He could never have accounted for the madness of one Sean Kelly. He was a big favourite and you know, he was the best rider by far at that moment. When I caught him, then he wanted me to share the work, but <laughs> at that moment, I was at the making a very big effort uh, to, get, to get to him, and, uh, you know, I said, no, I just, you know, I'm not able. And he, uh, he was the guy, he panicked for us, and he sat at the right, and, uh, you know, he, he kept, the, kept, the, kept, the, kept the gap between ourselves and the bunch, which, which was coming up very quickly. You know, if I had taken the front then, and uh, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have, you know, did as I did, he wouldn't have come over me. So he would have waited for me to lead out the sprint. And when you're in that position, it's the worst position to be on the front. So Sean Kelly was a brilliant winner again, but he was still hoping for one more big win, the Tour de Flanders in Belgium, the race that had eluded him throughout his career. Well, the Tour of Flanders was, it's a very important one, and if you live in Belgium, like I did for many years, for the Belgians, Tour of Flanders is, you know, is such an event, it's the event of the year. And, you know, I was, you know, one of the big favourites for many years, and finished second on many occasions, but I just couldn't pull off the two of Flanders. And, you know, there were seasons there where I was, I was the best in the race, um, by far, and, you know, there was always somebody slipped away, or, you know, the other, the other team tactics had just, uh, you know, they just cut me out of winning the event. Tour of Flanders is the most revered race in Belgium, and the best riders of their day have won it. But for Sean Kelly, it was never to be. The race is centred in an area famous for its short but steep hills and cobblestones. It should have been a gift from heaven for Kelly. It was his kind of race. I suppose his best chance came in 1985. He was in a leading group of four riders, surely the best finisher of them all. There was only one really good finisher here, and that was the rider following Sean Kelly's wheel, Adri van der Poel. By his own admission, Sean Kelly felt stronger than anybody else in the race this day. He was too confident. He led out uncharacteristically far too soon. It was a long way to the line. 
Adi van der Poel dug deep into his reserves and came up and overtook Sean Kelly. What a disappointment it must have been. It was, it's a, it was a disappointment, you know, not having, I would like to have, you know, had a, uh, a tour of Flanders in, in exchange of even one of the other classics. France, uh, you read about it, a couple of lines in the paper, and Eddie Merckx uh, wins his Tour of France for such and such a time, or you know, his third time, his fourth time. Um, but what it entailed, exactly how long the event was, I didn't realise until, until I was almost professional when I was, you know, 19 or 20. Um, when I became professional in my first years, um, I wasn't a guy who was, you know, capable of winning the classics, and I certainly wasn't capable of winning a Tour of France. And uh, you know, the classics I had to develop and get stronger and be capable of riding over them di that distance. And the Tour of France, I had a lot, I had a long ways to go because I was really a sprinter in my first years as a professional. And I had to, you know, at time trial, I had to improve quite a lot. In the mountains, I was limited. Uh, so, you know, I did never thought about winning a Tour of France in my first couple of years as a professional. But as time went on and when I, you know, I got stronger and I got stronger on all fronts, time trialing in the mountains, well then, um, you know, people start saying, well, you know, he's becoming a candidate for a Tour of France win. And I was a favourite, you know, a couple of years going into the Tour of France, but um, I think the one thing uh, that affected my performance in the Tour of France was doing too much in the early part of the season, riding all the classics, going down to Spain, riding Tour of Pays Basque, riding uh, Tour of Catalonia, and, you know, uh, racing from one event to the other. And by the time the Tour of France came round, I was a bit, you know, a bit tired, a bit, you know, suffering fatigue. When I look back now, um, I think if I had changed my program at the, at the beginning of season, I had a lighter program, I definitely could have had a better Tour of France finish. Uh, I certainly think a place in the podium, um, but I think a win would always have been difficult because in the high mountains, I was always, I always had a day where I, I suffered a bit and lost a bit of time. Having turned professional for the Belgian Flandria team in 1977, Sean Kelly's first Tour de France came the following year. Unlike most new professionals, his ability had shown he was ready for the toughest race of all at an early stage of his career. He was a great tour man, 14 tours and 12 finishes with a record four green winners points jerseys. The 1980 tour provided much drama. Out had gone race leader Bernard Eno with injury and new leader Jupp Zutemelik of Holland was also in a spot of bother. It was the year Kelly won two stages as well. ...being set by the champion of Holland, Johan van der Velde. Oh, he's going down. Oh, he's brought down the yellow jersey. Oh, my goodness me, that's terrible. Van der Velde has brought down the leader. Both mates, both teammates in TI Rally. This is big trouble now for Jopes and Velde. Back on his bike. He's obviously slipped the gear there as he went up. Now, let's see it in slow motion, what exactly happened there. He got out of the saddle, he slipped the gear. He's taken the front wheel away from under it and down goes... Job Zutemelk of Holland for TI Rally. That is an absolute disaster. Van der Velde himself. Zutemelk now being pushed off. A big shove. Now this is going to be a tremendous fight back for Zutemelk of Holland. 1 minute 18 seconds is all he has over Henny Kuiper. Kuiper's still in that leading group and you can bet your life that he saw the blood dripping off the left arm there of uh, Zutemelk. 
Zutemelk, after years of trying, finally went on to win the 1980 tour, the first victory by a rider sponsored by a British company. But Irish interest was still with Sean Kelly, and on the road to St Etienne, the hopes hit a high. Now we're back up to the front here, and the number 57 on the right of the screen is Sean Kelly with Lajaneta, looking very unwilling to do any work at all. But where are the other two men? Kelly on this climb looks to be in a spot of bother. Kelly, in fact, looks to be struggling on this climb. Now, is he in front or is he behind at the moment? Certainly, the little Spanish Lajaretta is a very, very good climber. I wouldn't expect uh, him to be left behind by Del Cuadro or Joe Mars on this climb. Kelly obviously making him do his turn at the front. He looked round at him, pushed him into the lead, and now we're going down the road, and they're away. This is tremendous. Kelly has gone clear of the two danger men as far as he is concerned, Joe Mars of Holland and Ludo Del Croix of Belgium. Those two riders losing a considerable ground on this climb now, and surely if Kelly can make the top of this climb, the descent and the finish will just be a formality for him. Now the main field, or what is left of the main field, being led up here, by Tozo, Jean Tozo, a new French rider in his first Tour de France. And in this group too, Jörg Zutemelk of Holland, the overall leader, and all of his dangerous men, second overall, Raymond Martin, and third overall, Henny Kuiper. Sean Kelly now settling into the long descent. This descent initially extremely wide and very fast bends and the rider is going to come down here something at up to 55 60 miles an hour and the weather absolutely beautiful so the speeds will be immense kelly pounding on that big gear now the highest of his 12 gears being pushed around there kelly seemingly not interested now in any help at all from lajaretta of spain now the climb is over What a nail-biting finish this is going to be for Sean Kelly. He always, he's always involved in something sensational, this young man from carrick on -Sure. He's been disqualified uh, earlier this Tour de France for pushing his way out of the main field and literally elbowing his way to the line and pulling jerseys and all sorts of things. And he was disqualified, although he won the stage. And he's also fought he's won twice when, in fact, there have been riders ahead of him, which he didn't know about. So now we're into this narrow road, and this is where Kelly and Lajaretta can make most of their gain. Extremely tight corners, Kelly visibly slowing down now. Speeds down to 40 miles an hour. Well, the news now really encouraging indeed. One minute the time gap, one minute, so they've gone back out to a minute, having been down to 41 seconds. And it's all the work of Sean Kelly. There is the main field. One minute behind Sean Kelly and Lajaretta. And taking no chances at all on this descent. Coming up towards the last two kilometers to go. And at the last, Lajaretta has gone to the front and he's doing some work. With about two kilometres to go to the finish, the Spanish rider Lajaretta has gone to the front and Sean Kelly is having to follow. Now, has Sean Kelly done just too much on this 19th stage of the Tour de France to now use his sprint and win what will be for him his second stage win in his Tours de France? The first for him this year. And Kelly now in second place. This is the first time Kelly has been in the slipstream of Lajaretta for the last eight miles of this stage. Kelly's done all the work, and there, one kilometre to go, so we're going to know the decision very shortly now. Kelly in the best possible place for the sprinter, for the element of surprise. Free win at last. He's been down to 41 seconds on that group, which contains Jörg Zutemelt, the overall leader, but he's, by virtue of all his own work, he's pulled the lead out again to 1 minute 25 seconds at the last check. So Kelly now knows there is some time available for finessing to try and outthink and outwit the Spaniard, Lajaretta. But even as I speak, Kelly goes back into the front and Lajaretta goes back into his customary place in second position. Remember, Kelly was disqualified at Nantes when he elbowed and pushed and pulled his way through the main field to win the stage there in a photo finish and the world champion, Jan Ross. He was disqualified and placed 101st on the stage.
stage. He hasn't forgotten that, and he's been looking for the stage win ever since. He's doing it in this most unusual fashion for a sprinter. He's broken clear of the field, and he's coming in towards St Etienne now with just one man to contend with. Kelly now knows that he's almost at the finishing line and he's in the wrong position in the front. Lahaneta looks to me as though he's a man preparing for the sprint. He's not going to give this one to Sean Kelly on a plate, certainly, despite the fact he's done no assistance to at all in this breakaway. They can now see the line. Kelly going for the line. Kelly must keep his line straight because the judges do not seem to like Sean Kelly too much in this race. Kelly, why? Oh, what's he done? Lahaneta sat up. He's giving it to Kelly and that was a gentleman reaction. Sean Kelly has won the stage. His first stage in this year's Tour de France. And now there is Sean Kelly. So Sean Kelly indeed is looking for the finish again. He won already into St Etienne. And now on Saturday, with one day to go to the end of the Tour de France, Kelly, number 57, riding just behind this rider, who is Johan van der Velde of Holland. There is Sean Kelly. So Kelly again looking for victory on this penultimate day and that's the gap so Sean Kelly clear at the moment with Johan van der Velde of Holland and there certainly doesn't seem to be a lot of interest at the rear of this main field but of course they're not likely to know that just ahead of the group now there are three riders clear and one is Sean Kelly of Ireland but there is Sean Kelly now out at the front of the group with him Johan van der Velde number 18 and it looks also like a Jerry Verlinden of Belgium And the gap is about 50 metres. And this is now the scramble from the main field to make contact with the leaders. And there's Johan van der Velde of Holland, still trying to work away clearly towards the end of this stage. Sean Kelly and all the field are on them. So that attack has not worked, but Kelly and van der Velde are still right at the front of this long, long line. This field now, an attack going there on the right of the road. Van Overschelder, I think that is. The Frenchman with this very strange Belgian sounding name. But the pack now extremely vigilant. And now they're being pushed around towards the finishing straight in the center of the picture. Calster, and he's done it again. Sean Kelly has won his second stage of this year's Tour de France. And that is the sight of the Eiffel Tower and the sign that the riders have at last come into Paris to finish the event. Well, there the field comes up to these beaten men who are dropping back into the peloton now, the main field. Sean Kelly passing through the picture now there. Also, the yellow jersey of Zutamel keeping his eye on affairs. Doesn't want to get involved in any silly accident now on these last few kilometres of this year's Tour de France. You'll always see that yellow jersey now at or very near the front of the group. And the whole field, you see how these riders are beginning to die in the sprint for the line now. Tremendous battle for the line here. They're hanging on and it's going to be trouble because these are where the cones are on the left of the road. They've taken the cones away now. Spin on the right of the... Where is Sean Kelly? Josh Jacobs in the centre of the screen now. Sean Kelly looks to be in fourth or fifth place. Coming up now towards the line. One of the Iceberg team has got it. And that certainly looks to me as though the win has certainly gone to Paul Vescuda of Belgium. His first win in the Tour de France, Paul Vescuda. And there, a very happy picture. Jerry Kanetemann waves the arm of the winner of the Tour de France, Joe Zutemelg of Holland. And Kelly did finish second on the stage. He now had a total of three stages in three tours, and his finish at 29th this time was his best to date, and he was still only 24. In 1981, the French Renault team were out to get Bernard Eno back on top after giving up the previous year. Kelly was on form again, winning the stage at Tonnes les Bains, but slipping in the overall picture to 48th. Then came 1982 and the first of four podium places in Paris, the champion of the race on points. As we join, Marc Gomez is leading. Absolute concentration. And the effort written 
written all over his face now, his mouth wide open, gulping in the air. Just a glance over his shoulder just to make sure his progress is sweet. At the moment, he's holding off the whole field. The adrenaline must be coursing now through his arteries because there's the field right behind him now and Kelly is right there in fifth or sixth position. Sean Kelly is right in amongst that field and Gomez, his brave lone escape is over and Kelly is there in third place. So now at last, can we see Sean Kelly win a stage of the Tour de France? He's had two second places, he's had fifth, he's had third. He's yet to win a stage. And at the front, the teammates here of Eddie Plankert, who's becoming the number one rival to Sean Kelly at the end of these stages of the Tour de France. But the field is tightening up now as they're coming in towards the Finishing circle, absolutely enormous crowd in Bordeaux. The whole of the city, I think, taking the afternoon off to see the arrival of the Tour de France. This is the most famous of all the finishing cities in the Tour de France and the most often visited. And for the first time, we're coming together in one large bunch. And now the attacks will come to the line, and this is a Sun Air rider trying to go clear now to stop Kelly winning the bonus. Reaction coming from the field. Surely they won't lose it now, these riders from the Saint francois team. Kelly can never have smelt the finish closer than this now after 10 days of racing and never won a stage. And look at the gap. Well, this is an opportunist win indeed. It's done. It's one of the Wolver team. Pierre, Raymond, Villemian going clear. And look at this gap. Villemian hasn't won a stage for the Tour de France for about four years, I don't think. A rider from the region lives not very far south of Bordeaux. He finished second yesterday beating Jan Ross to the line for third for second place and what an opportunist uh, what opportunity rather this is for Raymond Villemia and he's another man that can't sprint but goodness me he's got the gap now he's jumped the field just as all the sprinters were toying with each other waiting for the finish curve Raymond Villemia has broken clear the teammate of Gomez and he's coming up to the finish 300 meters to go now and it looks as though Gomez, or rather Vilmian now, Gomez, his teammate, is going. And look at the tip of the pack coming now. Can Vilmian make it? Kelly on the far right of the picture. Coming down the centre, Kelly. Vilmian uh, tries for the line. Look at the speed of Kelly. He's trying, but it's too late. Too late. Vilmian gets it. Kelly is second and robbed again. And that's Kelly's third, second place. And Raymond Vilmian gets the victory from Sean Kelly. But Sean Kelly increases his lead even further in his quest to winning that green jersey so we're now on the final climb of the day and nothing like as severe as the Pyrenees which you can see behind us there the Côte de Rontignon a short climb given a third category rating and immediately to the front comes Robert Albin the lanky Frenchman he really has no muscles at all this man yet he has such tremendous ability to climb the mountains he prefers to climb unusual for a climber really he prefers to climb out of the saddle most of the time. And alongside him, on our left, is the American Bowyer. And Bowyer now really climbing very, very well indeed, alongside Bernard Eno here in the yellow jersey of leader, of course, of this year's Tour de France now. Bowyer looking extremely determined, certainly not the face there of a man who's feeling the pressures of this stage. All the time, Alban setting the pace. And the reason for this, of course, is that his teammate, Bernard Valley, is in this breakaway. And Valley is the man he's trying to defend. Look at the face there of Phil Anderson as he goes through. Anderson now out of yellow and into white. Sean Kelly in that green jersey. And if ever there was a favourite now to win this Tour de France on point, it has to be Kelly. <laughs> And this group now coming towards the top of the final climb of the day. 18 riders in front, including Sean Kelly, including Bernard Eno, and including Phil Anderson. And what a great day this has been for Anderson, and especially for Kelly, because he's done what he never believed was possible. He survived with the best climbers in this year's Tour de France on the Col de Soulor and the Col de l'Obis. The Col de Soulor, 4,850 feet, and the Col de l'Obis, 5,607. The pace now being made here by Robert Alban. Alban in the front, trailed by Eno. 
Oh, and look at the face of Eno now, the determination. A man who's suffering just like Anderson there going through. And look at Kelly, his mouth wide open. But he must be increasingly confident now, knowing he's staying with these people. And with six miles to go, they won't get rid of him now. And maybe we're going to see Sean Kelly win the stage that he couldn't win on the flat, and he's going to do it in the mountains. So over the top of the last hill of the day, and that's all the Cote de one was, because it's nothing like the two big mountains the riders have climbed today, the Col de Lobis, the Col de Soulor. They were shrouded in mist and the most dangerous conditions I've seen in 10 years at Tour de France. Five yards, the visibility. And Phil Anderson and Sean Kelly. There's Kelly still in this group, and there's Jonathan Bowyer passing through too. Bowie's alert. Bowie is alert. He's looking around, so he's not a tired man. This could be a very good stage result now for the English-speaking riders. Three of them in this group, and there's only five of them in the Tour de France. This is the most elite leading bunch we've had in this year's race so far, because the mountains are always so selective. The pace being set here by La Haretta, trailed by Bernard Eno. Behind him is Bernard Valle. And here you can see Valet moving up there in that polka dot jersey to join Eno at the front. And so the riders now can almost see Poe for the first time. They're coming off the Pyrenees. The 18 leaders on the 12th day of the Tour de France. Led here by Robert Albin. Trail by La Haretta, and there are two of them in this breakaway, Marino and Ishmael. There goes Sean Kelly, Phil Anderson, Raymond Martin and Bernard Eno. Bernard Valley, Peter Winnen, Justin Wilman of Norway, Joke Zutemelk of Holland, Henny Kuiper of Holland, Jonathan Bowie of the United States, Johan van der Velde, the champion of Holland. What a great selective group this is. Just this long, narrow descent now, and all of a sudden the riders will drop off this descent onto a main road, and as if by magic, they'll be out of the lanes and into the wide boulevards of Po, where a huge crowd await them, and the riders then pass through the finish and do one circuit and come back to the line, and surely a win here for either Boyer of the United States, Kelly of Ireland, or Anderson of Australia. None of them now want to make a mistake because they're so close to home and with tremendous gains today. Kelly now going to be not just the leader of the Tour de France on points, but right up at the top, challenging again for that yellow jersey being held by Eno. And what about Anderson, third overall, and going to climb back up to second place. And out of the mountains for the day come the 18 leaders in the Tour de France. And the riders now swinging off into the wide roads of Bordeaux. And Sean Kelly has survived the hardest day of his career. And now, ironically, he could well win a stage of the Tour de France in the mountains, having not been able to do so on the flat roads. Kelly right at the front of this group in that green jersey. Alongside him is Bernard Eno in yellow. And the other top man of this year's tour, Phil Anderson, wearing white. And that's the little Betcher at the back of the group. The little Italian who has uh, at last come into his own on the climbs, joined the leaders for the first time in over 1,100 miles of racing. Way down at the moment in 60th place, but rapidly uh, putting matters to rights now as he goes clear with this very select group of 18 riders. In this group... Bert Bro of Switzerland, Zutemelk of Holland, Peter Winnen, Justin Wilman there, number 40, 91, Henny Kuiper, there's Winnen just passing out. And now we go towards the front, and again the Spanish rider, La Jareta, setting the pace, followed there by Bernard Eno and Kelly. Kelly now surely going to win the sprint. He's shown us every day of this Tour de France that when there's a group, he always wins. And I'm sure he won't let us down now unless he gets caught again by these attacks, and that's one of the La Jareta brothers going off up the road. There's two in this group, so forgive me if I make a mistake, they're exactly alike, the Ishmael La Jareta and the Marino La Jareta. Once the mountains of the Pyrenees came, the Col de Soulour, the Col de Bisque, they just flew up them like angels. Eno had to chase. 
Eno brought up the majority of riders in this group. Kelly caught up on the descent, and now as we approach the finish in pole, Kelly is looking likely for a win. Zutemelt there at the back of the group, but down below we can see that lonely figure of Laretta. Whether it's Ishmael or Marino, I simply do not know, but it's one of them. A huge crowd in Po. One of the best finishes on the Tour de France, this wide boulevard. Bernard Valley out of the saddle there. Bowyer in a wrong position here. I think he may feel he's done enough work to stay with Sean Kelly, his team leader. He's sitting at the back, but as we come through now, Eno showing himself at the front, and Kelly is going to have his hands full because I think Eno is still smarting, having lost the time trial to Jenny Kanateman. He might well try to win this, and when he wants to win, he has a sprint to match Sean Kelly, and Kelly knows it. Kelly tucks it right behind him now with one very small circuit to go, and Anderson in third place. What a finish the first day in the Pyrenees, and Kelly and Anderson have matched Eno pedal stroke for pedal stroke. 18 survivors of a great battle in the mountains. Men missing, jean René Bernardo. He's losing over two minutes, and that will make Anderson, without doubt, the team leader of the Peugeot squad. Joke Zutemelek, the great follower, again at the back of this leading group. Now, Kelly, I almost feel like please saying to him, please, Sean, don't make a mistake now. Don't let the counter-attacks go on the wrong side of the road. Kelly's reacting. Kelly going. He's not making the mistake this time. He's lost too many stages like that. And he's left Eno on his own. As we come round the corner now, Kelly in second place. He must be Valley. Valley leads. Kelly is too fast for Valley. Kelly waits. He waits. He watches. Anderson's on his wheel. Round again. Valley leads. Kelly followed by Anderson. What a finish. Kelly's going to go now. There's the line. Kelly. Anderson also trying. Kelly on the right, Valley on the left, Anderson also trying. Kelly, come on, Sean, for the last time. Kelly's won the last stage of the Tour de France. What a great result. And I think everybody will be delighted at that one. Sean Kelly gets his victory for the first time. And how ironic it's come at the end of the flat stages and in the mountains. Well, after that, I'm not too sure who's out of breath most, me or Sean Kelly. But indeed, what a fabulous spin. And I think uh, Sean's with me now. Sean... That was one of the finest sprints I've seen for many years. Yes, it was a, it was a very, it's a very, very fast, very, very fast finish. The circuit, you know, when we come onto the circuit, it was Eno who make the, who set the pace, and he, he set a very, very fast pace. And uh, yes, the sprint, it was, uh, I was, I was in a good position for the sprint. I take the last corner in, in second position, which was the, which was the best position really. And uh, then I, 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 I start my sprint and I win, uh, win quite easily. But, Sean, we've seen you nearly win three times on the flat, and now we come to the highest climbs in the Pyrenees. You not only stay with them, but you then beat the best climbers in the race. Now, how do you explain that? Yes, this morning, uh, before the start, I said to myself, uh, I've ride the last, the first, ten, the first ten days of the race, I ride very, very strong, and I always, we always ride for the for minor placings in the race. There's always a group that get away towards the end. So, uh, this morning, uh, I say, if I can pass with the... With the with the with the first group, if I arrive if I arrive to the sprint, then I, I have uh, I have a great chance of, of winning the stage. Now on the descent of both the Sulor and the Lobis today, it was very very foggy indeed and terribly dangerous. What was it like coming down? Yes, on the Obisk it was very very dangerous. The fog you could only see at at the first at when we when we started the descent we could only see less than 100 yards in front, 150 yards, and we couldn't see the corners in, in what in what direction the corners were turning. It was quite dangerous, and we we descend we descend very quite fast. But uh, yes, we get down okay. The group I was in, nobody falls. So right now, then we've won one. You're the green jersey. I can't see anybody taking that from you, Sean. But what will you do now in the next mountain stages? Yes, the green jersey. That's something I I do everything to take it to Paris. And uh, tomorrow stage is it's it's a mountain top finish, which is something it's it's a bit too hard for me uh, when it's arrival at the top. But uh, uh, yes, after the mountain stages, there's there's more stages on the flash, and there's there's some mountain stages that that also arrive at the at the bottom of the mountain. So you never know. Winning sprint points on a mountain stage assured the green jersey, an Irish first. In 1983, Kelly rated a different colour of higher value. 
you know, professionals when they dream about a Tour of France or uh, to get the yellow jersey. And then, of course, you know, if you become a rider who has who have the capabilities and who have, you know, who's an all-rounder capable of winning a Tour of France, you think about winning it. But every professional, you know, dream about carrying the yellow jersey on their back for one day. And I actually did that in one day and one day only. But, you know, I, I look back at that as being uh, one of my great achievements. Uh, you know, as I said, it's, it's something you look forward to when you become professional before you just become professional. And if you can do that, well, then, you know, it's, 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 a, great, it's a great achievement. So much so, only two other Irishmen to date have ever done it. Shea Elliott, the trailblazer in Europe, he kept it for two days in 1963. And doubler Stephen Roach, he hit the jackpot in 1987, when he won the race after a great battle with the Spaniard Pedro Delgado. Kelly, however, has a sad memory of his yellow jersey. Actually, I, I had that yellow jersey and my car was broken into in Paris after the Tour of France and it was actually stolen. So the yellow jersey that I, I, that I wore on the one day uh, that was stolen from my car, but I got, I got a, a yellow jersey from the organisation, the Tour of France, uh, so I've got that one, but it's not, the, it's not the real thing. Hasn't got the perspiration off? Exactly, because I did, I did have a lot of it on that day, because it was a stage in the Pyrenees, actually. I took it on the stage into Po, and the next day was into the mountains, and I really had a, a day of suffering. The Tour de France is all about suffering, but Kelly made sprinting look easy. In 1983, he was in green again and heading for a second win in a classification ranked second only to the outright victory. It was a jersey most important to him. Yes, well, the green jersey is it's very important, and in the Tour of France, uh, it's you know, it's it's after the after the yellow jersey, it's a very important, uh, a very important jersey, and it's it's big publicity for the teams, and after the Tour of France for appearance races, it's you know. It's very, very. It's, it's a race. It's a jersey that's you know very, very demanded, and uh, you know for me, I did uh, four times winner. It's you know it's it's a record and it still stands. In 1984, Kelly was stopped by Belgian Frank Hoster from winning three greens straight, but there were other things to celebrate. Well, on Wednesday between Sergi Francois and Alan Stott, it really was a mixed day for the Irish. It all began so happily because Stephen Roach began the stage knowing that his wife had just given birth to their new son. Nicholas, and he was anxious to tell all the race about it. In fact, he carried photographs of the child in his back pocket. So, with the permission of all the race, it was a happy moment when Stephen Roach was allowed to attack and press on to the village where he is adopted in Cerny Salancar by all the French people. In fact, he's building a house there. And waiting at the end of the street and flying the Irish flag was the mother of Stephen Roach, who'd come out from Dublin to see her new grandson and also to see her son in the Tour de France. It was an emotional moment, and the crowd loved it. But it was a different tale at the finish of the stage, because trying to celebrate the birth of Roach's son was Sean Kelly. And perhaps he was a little bit too enthusiastic, because he can be seen quite clearly here to push the former amateur world champion, Gilbert Glaus, towards the barriers. And so Frank Host wins the stage, his second stage win of the tour, and Kelly was an hour later disqualified and relegated to 140th place, fined at 90 pounds and penalised 15 seconds. Uh, yes, well, uh, in, in the sprint, uh, 300 metres in the line, I, I, I attacked my sprint and I was, I was on the front. And uh, 100 metres before the line, they had problems with the podium before the finish and uh, they had to move out the barriers. So the, bar the barriers fil filtered out onto the road and uh, Glos was on the inside, so naturally when the barriers came out, he also, he also pushed, pushed me to get out. And uh, the commissar said that I didn't keep my line in the sprint, because I looked at it a couple of times on television, and uh, I kept my line in the last 300 metres. It was the, it was the, the barriers which, which, you know, which was our fault. Yeah. And so to the mountains we go, Sean, and I've got a feeling we're going to see a lot of you coming in in the sprint finishes, am I right? Well, uh, I hope so. I hope in the mountains that I, get, <coughs> I can get through better than I did last year and uh, give it everything for the general in the, last, in the last two weeks. He climbed to fifth overall in the general and still ran Hoster to the line in the green jersey race. He's trying to play on this vital few moments of the Tour de France. All his effort going into this final kilometre, I think it is now, as we come through, there it is. The red flame flies in the sky, the last kilometre. And would you believe it, he's been caught virtually on the line. Vigneron goes back into the pack. Now, where is Sean Kelly? Because if he wins this, 
He's going to be in the green jersey as points leader of this Tour de France tonight. And that would be a result. Miller in the polka dollars, King of the Mountains, Kelly in the green. But they're coming up to the finish now in a mass sprint. I can see the green jersey of Frank Hoster, Belgium, jostling in the middle there, but he's well boxed in on the left. This could well be Liali on the front now. And I think Phil Anderson in second place, Jacques Hanegraaff in third place. Frank Hoster, Gilbert Glass of Switzerland is here too. Hanegraaff comes on the left now. Hanegraaff, Bernard Eno's having a go too. Eno's in the centre. Hanegraaff on the right. Hoster's on the left. Coming up to the line now, Jacques Hanegraaff. Coming to the line, Hanegraaff and Hoster. Frank Hoster takes the lead now. Eno is in third place. Hoster gets it. Sean Kelly was second or third, so a good result for Sean Kelly. Next day, the time trial and Kelly was a blink of the eyelid off beating Laurent Fignon, keeping him on Hoster's tail for his three green jerseys in a row as well. Kelly had always said, if you're near the top of the leaderboard, you can time trial fast. He proved it, losing by a tenth of a second in Villefranche on Beaujolais to the best time trial rider of that time. Kelly was also closing in on Hoster. The sign of Paris and all the riders passing by now. They know now this Tour de France is coming to an end. Number seven here, Yvon Madio. Number two is Vincent Barto. Number four is Dominique Gagne. These are the riders, the faithful servants of the overall leader of this race, Laurent Fignon. And there he is, Laurent Fignon, now approaching the Champs-Élysées. How must he feel? This was the greatest Tour de France for many years, and Fignon has proved he is the number one. All these riders in the yellow jerseys of Renault, and there is Robert Miller at the back of the field, sitting unaccustomedly at the back because he knows now his job is done and done well as the leader of the King of the Mountains competition. He can't be caught content to arrive in this big pack. But although the individual positions now seem to be settled as the tour comes towards the streets of the Champs-Élysées, there is still one great battle to be enacted because Sean Kelly, riding in the green jersey as leader of this race on points, must finish in front of Frank Foster of Belgium to be certain of that final accolade. White jersey there of Greg Lamont, the American in his first Tour de France. What a ride, finishing third, the best ever overall position from an American. The face of Alain Bondou, more accustomed to being seen on the banks of velodromes, riding just 5,000 meters, this time at the end of 4,000 kilometers. The attacks are beginning. This is going to damage the lead of Bondou. The cheers you may hear are all for Alain Bondou for all those people throughout the English-speaking part of the world, would they ever have thought that they would have witnessed three English-speaking riders coming onto the Champs-Élysées in third, fourth and fifth places for the first time in the history of the Tour de France. Phil Anderson goes through, Stephen Roach goes through, Theo de Roy, then Paul Sherwin. Again, Bondu looks over his shoulder. Again, he brings this race onto the Champs-Élysées through the finishing line. He's been in the lead now for over 10 miles. The only big question mark we have left to answer is, can Sean Kelly, and there he is, finish ahead of Frank Hoster, the rider just in front of him here in the blue, on the inside of Alan Piper in the white. If Frank Hoster wins this stage and Sean Kelly finishes even second, then Kelly will lose this race on points and lose that green jersey to Frank Hoster of Belgium. And I think, although our cameras didn't show it, the brave escape by Alain Bondou is over. He's been swept up by the pack. So rider number 33, Bondou, has been caught after a magnificent brave escape. And at least that will give him the prize of the day for being the most consistent lap winner on the Champs-Élysées. Now you can see all of the Tour de France, gutter to gutter. 124 riders and Sean Kelly in green and making his way towards the front of the group. Well, whatever happens in the sprint, whether or not Sean Kelly retains that green jersey, this has been an historic Tour de France. There's no doubt now that Robert Miller of Scotland will be the King of the Mountains and will finish fourth overall. The best Brit since the days of Tom Simpson, who finished sixth in 1962. There's no doubt either that Greg Lamond will become the best American ever in third place and keep that white jersey. And that Sean Kelly, green or not at the finish, 
will finish fifth overall inside the last kilometers of the finish and this is going to be the most hectic sprint that tournament made him earn it Kelly himself had gone around France in the fifth best time. He wasn't just a sprinter anymore and would be a favourite in 1985. Although 180 guys start Tour de France, not everybody had the chance of winning. There's maybe five riders capable of winning. You know, Greg LeMond, Bernard Hino, Stephen Roach, Phil Anderson and Sean Kelly. And it's basically a race between those five. And we're into the last kilometre now as Anderson comes over his shoulder, looks over his shoulder now, Phil Anderson on the outside now. But Eric Van der Erd is not in this group, but this is going to be a coup about that. At this stage of the 1985 tour, Kelly was keeping his options open. He was well up on the overall classification for the yellow jersey, fifth on that stage, and the leader in the red jersey town sprint competition. A third green had to be considered now. So the sprinters are being uh, approached by the stayers, as it were, in the Tour de France. The men who are thinking of that yellow jersey in Paris, still 1,900 miles away, because Sean Kelly has not yet made up his mind whether he's going to win this race for the yellow jersey, which is the jersey in the Tour de France, or for the race on points, which is the green jersey, for the race's most consistent daily finisher. Kelly is in second place in that competition at the moment, just a couple of points behind Eric van der Aard, who wears the green jersey as points leader today. So the field all together once again. The attack by Piper has been swallowed up. The cameraman on this motorbike quite literally leads a very precarious lifestyle. He's always in amongst the riders and on the mountains. It's a difficult job, but they're swinging into the home straight now as they come up the long, long finishing straight. It's the sort of finish that Sean Kelly will love normally. The red jersey of Kelly on the far right now. He has Van der Aard pushing him out of it. And Kelly on the far right of the picture now comes through. And there's punching and pushing going on there. Van der Aard and Kelly as they come towards the line now. Van der Aard gets the lead and takes the line. And in second place there, I think, was Leonard. But you know, I think there will possibly be an objection by Sean Kelly because Van der Aard quite clearly was bending on Kelly. Fists were flying. When the judges studied the video, they decided that Van der Aarden and Kelly on the extreme right of the picture here should both be relegated for their physical contact to 125th and 126th places in the race on the day. What was Kelly's view of that incident? I suppose when he brought me across the road, I was, I was lying on top of him. I was sprinting almost on top of his bars. And I didn't, I didn't leave my bars go because I knew, if, I, knew, uh, I knew when you take your hands off the bars, the common says they, they disqualify right away. So I tried to continue, but as I was going right over the left, towards the barriers, I had to, had to push him because I was afraid that he was going to put me into the barriers. And uh, at a speed like that, uh, if you hit the barriers, it's better to better be disqualified than hit the barriers at 60 kilometers an hour. You're in an unusual position, whereas you could win the green jersey for the race on points, which you've done twice before, but you also possibly have the ability to win this race and the yellow jersey, and no Irishman's ever done that. Which one are you going to go for? Well, for me, the green jersey, that, that's my, that was my objective right from the start, because I think I have more of a, more of a possibility to take the green jersey to Paris than, than the yellow but I will see how it will, how it will go, uh, for example, in the time till this afternoon. I think uh, it, that will decide a lot, and then in the following mountain stages. Uh, so f the race is very, very open up to, this, up to now. So I will see, I will see uh, what way I get through the mountains on the time plan. But little Colombian climber Lucho Herrera helped spoil Kelly's dream of winning the Golden Fleece as he combined with Bernard Eno in the mountains to move clear at the top overall. American Greg LeMond, involved in a personal battle with teammate Eno, was also forcing Kelly onto the defensive. This was a year of change and the clear arrival of not just LeMond, but also Stephen Roach. On the Col d'Obisque in the Pyrenees, Roach danced his way to his first ever stage victory. It was to be another memorable day for Ireland too. Eno was forced to chase to keep his lead. He had his hands full enough with Greg LeMond, but now another Irishman was giving him trouble. The Badger, as he was known, was a great fighter. At the summit of the Pyrenean Giant, Roach took the line in grand style. Looking back, this was the start of tour fame for Roach, but that was still two years away. Not far behind, Kelly delivered the Irish 1-2, and that had never happened before. Kelly went on to win that third green jersey, and while Roach finished third, Kelly took fourth. 
Injury left Kelly out of the 1986 race, and in 1987, the year of Roach, Kelly again had only sad memories of a crash. His non-finish for the first time brought only sadness to Ireland and his many race followers. 87 in the tour, um, I tore ligaments in my shoulder. Uh, it was one of the stages where we were going along at quite a, quite a casual, casual pace, and I was actually talking, I was chatting with Stephen Roach, and there was, uh, you know, there was a, there was riders break suddenly in front of me, and I wasn't concentrating. And that's the time some of the, you know, the most, that's the time you break something. I mean, those sorts of crashes because you're not concentrating, you're, you're, you're too relaxed. And uh, I was caught out in the, in the Tour of France that year. In defeat, Kelly showed the courage of a great champion. Everyone around him wanted to help because Kelly simply had no enemies. He deserved a better departure than this. The Tour of France is, it's, for a professional biker, it's a dream to win the Tour of France. And for me, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, if I'm going to win the Tour of France, well, it's got to be in the next two or three years maximum. If I don't, if I don't win it in, in, in the next three years, well, then I'm never going to win it. There was no animosity or envy in Kelly when he saw Stephen Roach win the race that year, thus becoming the first Irishman to conquer the Tour. But it didn't stop Kelly from wanting it for himself either. Uh, you know, Tour of France, it's, it's, it's you know, the most important stage race to win. And for every profession, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a dream. And uh, if I could win the Tour of France this year, well then, uh, I think that would, you know, just, it would just make my career. And if I didn't win another race until I retire, well, I don't think it would bother me. I'm not sure about that. Kelly loved winning anything, but there was no success in the 1988 tour. Did he find his Spanish team too weak? It affected him. It definitely, it definitely did. Um, because when I was riding with the Spanish teams, they were very interested in riding the Spanish races in the beginning of season. And any, any event in Spain which was of any sort of importance, uh, you know, I had to go down and ride in those events. And because of that, my program was, it was a bit, a bit too heavy in the early part of the season. And, I saw for by the time the Tour of France came around. He moved to the crack Dutch PDM team in 1989. He had a new programme and the Tour was part of it once more. But yet another Irishman was making progress. Early, early. early has gone for it. Martin Early has gone for it and looks as though he may take the stage. Will he follow in the footsteps of Shea Elliott in the past, Sean Kelly in the past, Stephen Roach in the past and become the fourth Irishman to win a stage in the most famous cycle race on earth. And it Martin Early from Dublin is going to win the stage of the pole and do what Sean Kelly did seven years ago. Martin Early coming in round the last bend and into the enclosure now. And the crowd's coming out to greet him. What a day for Irish cycling. Nearly four hours in the saddle. And Martin Early with those other stragglers coming behind him. He has a look. Well done, Martin. Super, super. Martin Early has won the stage to pole. Early never rose to the same dizzy heights as Kelly and Roach, but on this occasion he was on Kelly's team, and Kelly did don the green jersey again the same day. Next day, Miguel Indurain was winning in the mountains at Coteray. But Kelly was also on a high after a great day out in the Pyrenees. He arrived to take fourth place, and the sprinter come climber was again on top form. I had a very good day today, and hopefully it will continue tomorrow on the, in, in, the, in the Alps in the stage in the Alps and, uh, and looking forward. It's good for the morale when you climb the first day because a lot of the times the first stage in the mountains was always difficult for me to get settled in. But today I was really climbing well, so hopefully it will continue for the rest of the tour. Kelly had brought himself back from the black hole of two years and was feeling good again as he pulled on the red jersey for the town sprint leader. He also had the combined jersey and the green jersey. He was giving a rare broad smile and life on his team was good. 
For Stephen Roach, the pendulum had gone the other way and he was out with a knee injury. In the broom wagon was the fourth Irishman of the day, Paul Kimmage. This only proved how far ahead of the rest Kelly and Roach were. By Paris, the PDM team had proved themselves to be the best, taking the team award. Kelly got the red jersey. He got the green for a record fourth time, but in his 11th tour, in which he had finished ninth, he realised now that the yellow, as winner, would never be his. I won the Tour of Spain in 88, and um, I went to the Tour of France. I was hoping that, you know, uh, that I was going to be on the podium and maybe win the Tour of France. But uh, when it didn't work out that year, uh, but I think that's at that moment, that year, it started to set into my mind that, you know, to win the Tour of France would be very, very difficult. And I think 89 was the year when I decided, I think, um, I accepted that, you know, it was, it was never going to happen to, be, to win the Tour of France. So to 1990, and on the road to Alp d'Huez, as the race headed for the base town of Bourg d'Oison, the PDM team had slipped up, and Kelly had to take on a new role of helper for Dutch team mate Eric Breuking. The situation was we were in a group of about 20 riders, and about four PDM riders. It was getting very near the refreshment, into the refreshment zone, so I decided to go to the car, and there was a group that get, got away with Le Monde and Delgado and a lot of the important guys, and there was nobody from our team with us, so... Immediately our team director came along and he said, well, there's two guys who have to got a ride now. And uh, I, was, I was the guy, I decided immediately whether it was, it was me and there was another guy, Ampler. He was a new rider from the team, an East German guy, and he didn't want to ride. Although he was his, his first year professional, he had the idea that he was, you know, one of these great riders. <laughs> and there was, a lot of con there was a lot of talk about that, you know, after, the, after that day. And uh, it, was, it was a very hard day for me and I lost, I lost so much time in the Alpe d'Huez. I really lost the chances of doing anything in the general class of the Tour of France that day. But I feel I don't regret doing it. I think I was, one, I was one of the two guys who had got to do it, and I just you know, did it immediately. There was no time to start having a team meeting about it there and then. Well, I remember in the Tour de France when I went third in the overall, we had a stage to Alpe d'Huez, and we lost the grip of the race between the, I think, the Glandon and the Alpe d'Huez. There was a group going away with Inrain and Lemont, and, and then he was the man who chased between the two mountains for me and for Alcala and that was what what saved my my good classification and so even though he was a winner himself and one of the greatest riders he was never afraid to become a helper a domestique no at that, that moment I, I always remember uh, from him Kelly was a two professional in 1991 though the PDM team was again the talking point of the tour but for the wrong reasons the PDM affair that was you know uh, a glucose lift that the doctor was giving us and it was uh, it, it was contaminated, and um, you know the, the whole the whole team was sick, and uh, everybody at high temperature, and everybody was out of the race. Uh, we all had to pull out of the race on the, on the same day. The PDM sponsors left the sport, and Kelly was nearing the end of his affair with the Tour de France. There was only one more tour to follow for him after almost 20 years at the top, but he could look back on having ridden and often beaten the best. His favourite cyclist was Bernard Eno for the way he commanded so much respect in the peloton. He rode alongside the pioneering American, Greg LeMond. Eno liked Kelly, too, because he was a real fighter. Eno loved fighters. They all respected Sean. I think Sean Kelly has to be one of the toughest riders I ever raced with. He used to race from the start of the season right the way through to the end, and he was always competitive, and he always wanted to win. He's a very, a very tough man. He, he never say die. He was always in there, whether it was fighting for first place or third place or whatever. You know, like a lot of the stars of today, they, they give everything to, to win, and once they can't win, well, they, they, they more or less throw in the towel. I, I saw, I've seen Sean do some great rides to run a place as well, not only to win, but uh, to run a place, and, and for many years, he's the best cyclist in the world, and I think... That only goes to show how good he was. His mentality and uh, the way to treat younger riders and, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, just to, the way he behaved and the, sometimes the way he rides. <laughs> he was very, uh, yeah, he was very, he was very good of, uh, you know, teaching young riders to, uh, to do the right thing. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of riders have, uh, you know, a lot to, uh, well, they can thank uh, Sean for a lot of things. He didn't take on the airs and graces. He was the same whether it was with the domestique or whether it was Bernard. You know, he spoke to them in exactly the same tone. I think that's probably also why the, the Irish people liked him so much because it, they could relate to him a lot more than maybe they could relate to Stephen Roach because Roach was a man from Dublin. He was a man from the big city. And Kelly was a man from the small villages. 
Et c'est quoi ton euh, souvenir de Sean et comment il était avec le, la peloton le... Avec le peloton, c'était le, le coureur qui, qui, je crois, n'avait aucun ennemi dans, dans le peloton. C'était euh, le numéro un mondial pendant plusieurs années. Et la mémoire, moi, j'ai connu Kelly en 76 chez les amateurs encore dans une petite course en France et c'est là où j'ai fait la connaissance de Kelly et j'ai tout de suite vu que c'était un futur très grand coureur. Quand j'ai commencé le cycling, Sean Kelly était déjà le grand le King Kelly. Pour moi, c'était toujours un idole pour moi parce qu'il a gagné tellement de races et puis aussi, pas parce qu'il a gagné, mais aussi sa personnalité personnalité était très importante pour moi aussi. Then I was race, racing with him also a lot of years, I think seven years. And I, for, for me, is one of the most impressive person I know because racing, the personality, everything he has. I think one of the greatest things about Kelly was he actually reflected the fighting spirit of the Irish, which is probably why the Flemish adopted him, because the Flandrians were tough people as well and they felt that Kelly was one of their own. Yeah, I think that Kelly, uh, the last year, uh, as well. In the beginning of the year, the year is one of the best couriers uh, over the whole world. And in the Netherlands, with the Netherlands, and the Paris And uh, ondanks that he stopped, he still remains in Belgium a great name in the wheel sport. Today, I think, just sums up what Sean is like. Someone who's sort of fighting all the time. And even in his last race, he fights for the very last minute, and he, he's won it. So I think that just sort of sums up you know, the, the fighting spirit of Sean, and I think that's one of the reasons that he's been so good for so long. I mean, any rider who sort of stayed, or any sports person who stays at the top of their sport for almost 20 years, is, you know, they've just got to be incredible. Sean was a very special guy also, a very big champion, uh, I think also a good friend. Uh, I was not riding so much with him, but uh, in the beginning of his career I was riding a few times, and uh, I saw immediately he was a big, very, very big champion. Arrivé dans le peloton, il ben, y a quand même quelques années. Hein, J'ai des sommes comme into the peloton a couple of years ago as a warrior. C'est un coureur qui s'est toujours battu euh, loyalement comme, comme on doit le faire dans la compétition. Et je pense que si aujourd'hui il y a autant d'anciens champions avec lui, c'est parce qu'on euh, a beaucoup d'admiration pour lui. Kelly was loved by all, by none more so than the people of Carrick on Shore, where Kelly still lives. He's never forgotten those who followed him. Well, that's the advantage when you're living in a small town of you know, 5,000 people. Everybody knows me so well and they, they look forward, especially in the big races like the Tour of France, the World Championships and the Classic races. They always look forward to the results. And uh, if I, you know, when I win a Classic race, I'll you know, do very well in the Tour of France, but everybody the next day is just talking about it in the town. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's really uh, it's great and it's, I think it's, it's also good for, the, for, for yourself because it gives you that more, a bit more incentive to go on. Carrick honoured Kelly by naming the town square after him, not at the end of his career, but early on during it. He always gave them every reason to feel proud of his achievements. Sean Kelly has had a great influence on cycling in this town and in this country. Uh, I probably wouldn't be in the club if uh, Sean Kelly wasn't around. He might give us a couple of tips for the racing season, you know. <laughs> you get a new bike, yes, and all that sort of stuff, you know. Someone who's got involved in cycling only for Sean Kelly here in Carrick. And I think it's very good sport. And we go out training every weekend, and Sean Kelly comes out, and it's great when he comes out training with us. These were the times Carrick will never forget, nor repeat. Sean Kelly may never have won the Tour de France, but he did win the Tour of Spain, the first and only Irishman to do so. And the town gave him a big city welcome in its only main street. My privilege to formally welcome back to Pelican Shore the conquering hero and to congratulate him on his marvelous success in the Tour of Spain. <laughs> I'd like to say that I'm honored to be back in uh, back in Carrick uh, after winning uh, such an event for me to win the Tour of Spain. Uh, it's so important, uh, words don't really explain it because I, over the past couple of years I've won, uh, won so many races but people said yes, I, you've never won a big tour, a national tour and now f for me to win the Tour of Spain, well it's, you know, it's so important um, and I think you know, to break that barrier well then I can go, go on to further things. Hey! Hey!
Kelly on the right of your picture wearing the green uniform. Kelly with Guterres and Dominguez. And Kelly goes for it, takes the rider's ground. I think uh, just about held out there. Kelly, one of his typical poses, sprinting for the line, just in front of Guterres. Kelly should have won the Tour of Spain twice, and the year before, in 1987, he was in fine sprinting form early on as he raced to the end of the stage in the yellow jersey to snatch second place. He lost the lead, but in the time trial, despite a problem, he was again heading for yellow. What's very significant on the day is that he will be much faster than race leader Lewis Herrera. And despite the fact that Kelly was suffering with a boil, at this particular stage and having a lot of difficulty on the saddle, shifting from right to left, left to right, trying to get comfortable. Sean Kelly, grimacing in pain, takes 29 minutes and 35 seconds. So for the fourth time in three weeks, Sean Kelly will take the yellow jersey in the Tour of Spain. But that cyst, the size of an orange, just had to be removed. So Kelly was forced out of the Vuelta de España when race leader. Would he ever get to win a major tour? I, I feel okay, but uh, the morale is the morale is down. Actually, uh, you know, it was it was so so close to winning the race, you know, at such a late stage, uh, to winning, you know, a national tour. Could put my full weight on the battle because it was just, you know, it was just so painful. But I said to myself, yes, well, I have to go on, and you know, uh, maybe uh, maybe the following day it would be better. A forlorn hope, and Kelly left the race with great sadness and appeared on Spanish television distraught and disappointed. But he reset his sights for 1988 as he recalled an Ireland's top-rating gay burn show. Um, I really you know, got, got through a good winter and my training has, uh, has really went well and went as, as I planned it, going, coming out of the season last year. And that's something that never happened over the years. I've always planned, but I never... They never seem to work out because you know you're you're either doing going away somewhere or there's you know something to be done. Your, your training program is always upset, and this year you know I've got I've, I've got to I've got to do what I planned out for myself. In the 1988 Vuelta, Kelly had lost two minutes overall, but he was determined to win a big tour, and time was running out. He'd been a pro over ten years. This had to be the one. Sanchez there. Going towards the finish of the crowd, trying to encourage him through. And who's this? It's Kelly coming. Kelly in the green. Van Brabant with Kelly, and Kelly swallowing up. He takes, first of all, Sanchez. That's cruel look. He's about to take the motorbike as well. And more important, he's about to take the stage. I was riding very strong, and there was a Spanish a Spanish clan, as they say. And, uh, you know, they were riding, they were doing everything to try to, you know, to, try and to get me to distance me before the final time trial. And you know I was riding very strong, and uh, I was you know I, hang, I hung in there in the mountains and didn't you know lose lose any time. The star names are staying together. The polka dot is there. Werty in brown. Sean Kelly in green, and Cubino in yellow. Uh, this is the day that uh, Kelly fears most, and it's the day that the the BH team have got to do damage to Kelly if they want to win this race. And Cubino is in trouble, and this now is. Uh, it looks good for Kelly at the moment, although there are other BH riders there now. But they're setting a fast pace, and it's Cubino is the one who's cracked for it. Para now doing a lot of attacking now on, on this climb, and Fuerte and Kelly responding. Cubino seems to be in trouble again. Pino looking over at him and, and telling him to try and sit sit in the, on a wheel, and I'll bring it back up to the, these three leaders. But, uh, Para doing a lot of driving at the front now. Kelly now taking over and obviously feeling good. Knows Cabino is in trouble and knows now is the time to, to attack him. And attack him he did. Laudolino Cubino had a reputation as a climber and Kelly broke him in his own backyard. This was the ride of a tour winner at last. A year on and the Tour of Spain had brought a big smile to his face. But as he enjoyed the moment, he still had to outride Fuerte in the final time trial before Madrid could welcome him home. Kelly's main adversary now was Anselmo Fuerte, another great climber he had tamed in the mountains. Few believe Kelly wouldn't handle him in a time trial, as this was now advantage Kelly, the man who almost had, but never so far had succeeded. He spinned it home like it was a road race, and with one day to go, there was no doubt now who would win. While the cheers in Carrick on shore could be heard in Madrid, Kelly had built a healthy lead. He marched with confidence back into his team coach with a day to go.
In the mass bunt finish in Madrid, the Amarillo jersey of Kelly was near the front, giving others the pleasure of last day glory. His was the pleasure of 12 years of effort. Sean Kelly had swept the board. He'd won in style, snatching all of the jerseys which were presented to him one by one. Kelly had done it. He'd refound himself and he had proved his point. He was the very best. It gives personal satisfaction to win a national tour of three weeks, like a tour of Spain, a tour of Italy or a tour of France. Uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the feeling is great. And um, now when I look back, I say to myself, well, you know, it was a pity that I didn't get through in 87. I would have won, maybe I'd have won you know, the Tour of Spain twice. It's always the same situation in sport. There's, you know, there's, the, there's the, the people who say, well, you're capable of winning a Tour of Spain or he's capable of winning a Tour of France. Mm -hmm. And there's the other ones who say, well, he'll never win it. You know, he'll never win a, a three-week Tour because uh, he's not consistent enough and he always has an off day. And, you know, so I proved to some of those people, you know, that, that said that, well, I proved to them that I could win it, you know, a three-week tour. And, uh, but, you know, those people, you know, they, they never really worried me, I think. I think it was my, for, for myself, first of all, you know, there's personal satisfaction and also for the, the sponsors who, uh, who, you know, for me, when I won the Tour of Spain, I was with a Spanish team, it was an enormous importance for them. Ever the quintessential professional, Kelly, along with Stephen Roach, were honoured by the Federation of Irish Cyclists. Between the two of them, they had won every major race in the world. <laughs> Kelly perhaps still has one regret, as he only has two bronze medals in the World Road Championship. He wanted gold, of course. Even so, his first bronze medal came after a gold medal performance, as one man took on the rest of the world in Goodwood in 1982. When he rode in 1982 in the World Championships, which were in Goodwood, down in the south of England, he finished third, and what a terrific ride that was, because he not only took the bronze medal for Ireland, and all Ireland was at Goodwood, with his name written on the road in chalk, um, but uh, he'd taken on all the Italians who were racing for one man, Cerrone. He'd, ta he'd taken on all the Dutchmen. He'd taken on all the uh, Belgians, and he nearly beat them. It was a tremendous ride. That really was memorable. I rode a very good race, and... Uh I was very active in, you know, in the in the end, when the you know when the important moves were going, and maybe a bit too active at times, because I was give, you know going away in groups that were attacking, and the Italian team was just riding on the front and keeping being anybody that went away just taking them back, and then in the sprint, Saroni was just you know too strong for everybody when he when he sprinted, he just went away from everybody on the final uphill sprint, but I was very pleased with my third place and. Uh, you know, third place in the World Championships, and I was, I was probably thinking of years to come, I said to myself, well, you know, I have a third place now at least, uh, it's a stepping stone, one day I'll win it. 18 laps of the 9.5 mile circuit are to be covered, giving a total distance of 171 miles, and the winner at the end will certainly know he's been in a gruelling race. I must say, Hugh, that uh, we saw Sean Kelly starting off in the front there, and that's where I think we'd like to see him for most of the next five or six hours of racing, isn't it? I think Kelly's the man that uh, would very much like to win this event, particularly as it's on British soil. Bernard Valley just there, coming into shot up this long hill. What a lonely race it's been for him. The big bunch will be coming in a minute as he looks back to swallow him up, and there was Sean Kelly right at the head of affairs. It's interesting to note here, Hugh, that they aren't, these riders are now completing the exact distance of yesterday's amateur race, 114 miles, and Valley now showing all the signs of a very, very weak man now, and they've realised they can catch Valley and pick him up. This is the first time they've seen Bernard Valley in nearly four hours of racing. And Sean Kelly there in third place, and the crowd are going absolutely berserk here. They've realised now that there's a good possibility of a world champion coming from Ireland for the first time ever. But going through there in the second place was Bill Schulten of the Netherlands team. You. you can see that the brakes are starting now. Riders are starting to feel each other out after this four and a half hours of racing. And Sean Kelly really alert on the front. Tommy Prim picked up some more food there, he's put it in his pockets, thrown the musette away, and we're going to get a splinter group that's going to come from the front of this big bunch to join Tommy Prim now. Bell Scholten on the front, Henny Kuiper also there, 
Jan Ross in fourth place, Ginetti in third place in that blue jersey, Jonathan Bowie there, fifth in the World Championships, let us not forget this, in 1980 in Solange. This can play into Kelly's hands, the fact that the tempo goes up at the front from a teammate will stop people trying to jump away. We'll see as they come out of the trees whether he is still at the front. Yes, Kuiper's still there, he's putting the pressure on, so this is stopping anybody going away. On Kelly's right is also his teammate there, Stephen Roach, the man who won Paris Nice last year. So two Irishmen here at the kill. Hugh, there's never been an atmosphere like this in Britain before because every time the spectators catch a glimpse of the television monitors and they see that green jersey, they just let out an enormous cheer because they believe that Sean Kelly will walk away with his title. Kelly surely will not allow this to go. La Giretta trying again, Jonathan Bowyer joining him. So La Giretta of Spain and Bowyer of the USA, neither nation having won the world title before. La Giretta glances over his shoulder and how on earth he's finding the strength now to go for home on this final lap when he was away for the previous lap, I really don't know. But Boya goes clear and Boya must not be left, left alone because he was fifth in the world title on a very, very difficult course in Solange a year, uh, two years ago. Sean Kelly realising the danger, he's surging to the front, so are the Dutchmen, but look at Jonathan Boya, he's attacking after almost 169 miles, he realises at the end he's in sight, he would be the first American to ever win this world title, but the Dutch realise the danger, they're trying to close the gap, Sean Kelly very well placed there, he's on the wheel at the moment of Giuseppe Cerrone, the man who could possibly dislodge him in a sprint finish, so the big sprint is starting to mass at the front, but they've got to catch that Lagiretti and Jonathan Bowyer of course he's the man who's going away he's taken the chance this is what can happen at the end well 65,000 people here are being treated to a most extraordinary finish of the world championship in Goodwood Bowyer changes gear he glances over his shoulder he knows he can still do it and Greg Lamont of the United States comes as well now really Lamont should not be doing this because he's bringing with him all the other riders towards his teammate and one of those riders is Sean Kelly. Round the corner comes Jonathan Bowyer, and just behind him comes the whole field. Bowyer now heading up to the finish. It's agonizing for this, and right past him goes Giuseppe Cerrone. Cerrone is going to take the world title. This is a tremendous finish for Italy, and look at the speed of him now. Cerrone washes by Bowyer as he comes up the line, and tips right in with the crowd. Cerrone of Italy, and the Italians are going absolutely mad here on the line as they are about to hit the line now. Giuseppe Cerrone has won the world title. He throws kisses to the crowd. And in second place there goes Jonathan Bowyer. And I think Sean Kelly was third with a bronze medal. The story of Villac in Austria. This was going to be the race that Kelly was going to win. What happened? Well, again, you know, I was one of the favourites um, you know, on the world championships. Um, it was my my style of event. It's you know like it's it's like a classic, uh, the World Championships, and so I was one of the big favourites, and I was riding very well, and the conditions were suiting to me. It was very wet conditions, pretty cold, and in the final I was riding quite strong, and we're in that group of I think about fifteen, maybe a bit more of riders, and Stephen was with me, and uh, you know the other riders they rode very well, Martin Ellie and Paul Kimmich. Uh, they did a lot of work up to the time that they, they lost contact from the first group, but they were keeping things together and um, giving us a help out in general. And then we were in the final, and in the final lap there was a lot of attacking, and Argentine was just, he was just stuck to my rear wheel, he was following me everywhere I went. And I just said to Steve, and I said, look, you know, this, the way that these guys are attacking me, you just have to try and one of us go to each group, and at least like there's one of us up there in the final after, you know, after after putting up such a good show and the other guys working so hard for us and uh, you know they'd attack go and I'd go with and then to be caught and there's another one go on Steve and be with it and the one that went Stephen was with it and I didn't you know I didn't chase because I had Argentine he was you know he was hanging out with me the last lap and a half or two laps and uh, Stephen pulled it off in the sprint and he you know he he really calculated calculated really well he attacked just before the sprint and uh, you know won the world championships it gave me enormous amount of pleasure because I suppose we an Irish team of four riders and winning against you know the big Italian teams of a 12-man team, the French and the Belgians. Uh, it was you know a, a rememberable day. Did you feel you caught them? Well, Argentine was. Um, I think if it came to a sprint, I think Argentine would have been very difficult to beat. I, I definitely think I would have you know I would have uh, a big problem beating them on that day if it came to a sprint. And you know I think we did. Uh, we worked it well tactic-wise and. We won the event, and that's what's what counts.
in 89, I arrived in the sprint in Chambly with Greg Lamont and uh, Rooks and a group of riders. And um, I think if if anybody wanted to bet, take a bet for me there, I would have put a lot of money on myself that I would have been world champion with a half a mile to go. Uh, because, you know, Le Monde was probably, you know, the the best sprinter of that group. And I think, you know, out of 10 times, I've, I would probably beat him eight times. And that, was, that had been the case right through uh, the previous year or the previous three years leading up to that. And um, I made a mistake with the gear selection. I was a little bit too low, and Le Monde was riding very strong. He had, you know, he had a super year that year, and he was he was very strong on that day in Chambry. And um, he laid out the sprint from a long way out, and uh, it was a very fast sprint, and that that didn't help me with my with, with being on the gear. And I was beating, and I was, you know, so disappointed. I was really, uh, I was the last. I could have finished second, but in the last ten meters, I stopped sprinting, and Coney Chef. He went by me and he finished second and I was told and but I was uh, you know, it was a, a real disappointment that day. Well after the event I was really I was really down. Uh, I suppose, you know, the most the most down I've ever been uh, after an event and you know I didn't uh, I didn't want the medal at, on the on that on the moment after the event. And uh, I think uh, Frank Green had the medal in the end and uh, I think he should still have it. Kelly fought back tears, a world title he felt had been snatched from him. But look what didn't escape on a marvellous career. Three times the winner of the Super Prestige Perno. Twelve classic victories, his highest finish in the Tour de France was fourth. He won the green jersey four times, he won the Tour of Spain. Of the other events around the world, he was always a winner. Seven straight wins in Paris-Nice, twice the Tour of Switzerland. It just goes on and on. Kelly was a true champion. They call it the race to the sun. When Frenchman Jacques Ancotil won it five times, they thought that was a record which would never be equaled, never mind beaten. Kelly changed that. On the mountain of Col d'Ez, the traditional end to the Paris-Nice above the city, Kelly was racing to his seventh win in a row. The French were saying he was using the gear of the devil, stamping on the pedals, daring anyone to take the race he had won for the past six years from him. The time he had to beat, 2013, and the French knew it was a formality. As Kelly turned into the home straight, the clock counted it down. He was well inside. He was again the winner of Paris-Nice, a record seven times straight. The Tour of Switzerland was another event the Irishman claimed for the first time in 1983. He came back from a broken collarbone in March to the victory in June. Here he uses his sprint to win the third stage and take the leader's yellow jersey. He was doing to the Swiss what he had done to the Italians, Belgians, Dutch and French. He was winning stages as he pleased. His timing was always inch perfect. In 1990, he would win the Swiss Tour again, ironically after also breaking his collarbone at the beginning of April in the Tour of Flanders. In bike races, there are always crashes, and these are the hazards which haunt the riders who feel they have a chance of final victory. For this reason, they rarely predict their chances of the win until the last stage is over and relief follows. Kelly had no such problems in 1990. He had a strong team around him, and he was helped by the experience of teammate Rudy Darnans, who controlled the furs by organizing the rest of the team. Kelly won the Tour de Suisse for a second time. Back home in Ireland, racing was becoming a showpiece sport for Kelly and Roach. In Cork, the competition was at its best. Roach leading here and Kelly were on show and giving their best before a huge crowd. These were great days for cycling in Ireland. Roach crashes out in a no-quarter given race and this left Kelly to sprint to victory. After this, Kelly then took on Chris Lillywhite, a fast British finisher who didn't like playing second string to anyone. And it really is a gamble, isn't it? Well, this is Kelly and Lily White to come round the corner. Lily White leads and Sean Kelly now. Kelly's going to have to unleash something special. He slipped up to the big gear. 
breaks very late, his mouth wide open, and leans into that bend, he's got to come off the wheel of Lily White, that'll take some to him, but Kelly wants to do it tonight, Sean Kelly is going to come through, he's in the barriers, he's leaning there, he gets it, he gets it in the most amazing sprint finish, he leans on... Yeah, the, first, uh, the first listen, we didn't, you know, we didn't really know what to accept and what way the people would turn out, and... Um, the first Nissan that came to Carrick and you know, that stage uh, down into Wexford, like the turnout that day was, you know, it was, it was an, a great turnout, the amount of people that came out. And uh, then we came to Carrick on the second stage and the amount of people that turned out in Carrick was, you know, unbelievable. Um, and it gives, you know, the feeling when you, go, when, you go, when you go out on your bike there and, you know, you're competing at the end of the stage and the people, you know, there's so much people shouting at you. Uh, you know, it gives you that much extra again. I think you're that much, you're that many percent better on on home ground with, with your local support, the people behind you. Do you remember the day you rolled down the start house in the time trial in that first Nissan from yes. Sean Kelly Square? Yes, I certainly do. And yeah, the people, like the crowds of people, they were hanging out every window and hanging out everywhere. And uh, you know, the atmosphere was unbelievable. And I think that set me off on that, you know, that super time trial, John Mel. That time trial was, you know, definitely, uh, it was one of my best, I think there's two time trials, that was one of them. Uh, the other one was in the Tour of Pays Basque, I was riding so strong, uh, you know, in the one to carry to Clonmel and then the one that the Tour of Pays Basque. Uh, at times, like, I was wondering, was I going to bend the bike under me, that was, I felt so strong on those days. Kelly in fabulous form as the signpost for Clonmel shows him. He's just gobbling them up. This is power harnessed to maximum effect. Terrific stuff. Well, Kelly catching, first of all, turn Van Vliet two minutes ahead of him on the road. Now two minutes behind him on the overall classification. And the next man in his sight, Adri van der Poel, and Kelly takes him too. So both the riders, equal on time at the start, are now behind Sean Kelly. This is a magnificent ride by the Irishman. And if the average speeds are correct that are coming our way, Jimmy, then the average speed of Kelly around 32 and a half miles an hour, we are watching Sean Kelly ride the fastest time trial of his life. We have checked him on one of our cars here right beside him and he's touched over 45 miles an hour at times so the average is certainly over 32. A man on a mission, dedicated intent. The crowds have come to see him. Roach has come to test him. Kelly is producing the goods. This is marvellous stuff. But fair play to Van der Poel. He's responded and reacted and he's coming back at the Carrick man. Well, he must come back at him because he can't ride behind Kelly for too long. He'd be penalised for that. So he must attack Kelly and he's trying to get back on turn. But you know, Kelly has been cheered all the way from the start in Sean Kelly Square and drawn like a magnet into the square at Clonmel. This is a man possessed. It's a long way to Tipperary, but it's a lot quicker with Kelly in the saddle. He really is driving for it now. This is a day, a morning he'll never forget. It's a phenomenal time trial. And a time trial is turning out to be a sprint. Van der Poel is back at him again. He beat him in the sprint yesterday in Carrick. Is Kelly going to be beaten two days in a row by this Dutchman? Let's wish the finish. Look at the crowds. Look at the enthusiasm. It's fantastic. In Clonmel, Kelly goes for it. Kelly takes it. And not allowed that. He wins the stage. And he's 49 seconds better than Stephen Roach. That's sensational. When we look back on all the listeners we had, uh, you know, there, was, there were great events and, um, you know, the royals we had here in this country, and the people that turned out, uh, in the schools, uh, when you go to any village or any town like the schools, everything was closed down uh, and they were all out, you know, to see the Nissan and, you know, they were, they were marvellous years. Uh, you know, you look, go down to Cork, Patrick's Hill, uh, you know, the number of people on Patrick's Hill, it was, uh, you know, you just so many people and this, you could as you were coming around to go Patrick's Hill you could hear the people up on hanging on Patrick's Hill and you could hear the shouting it was uh, you know it was it was really it was really moving and uh, you know the feeling was it was just unbelievable remember the incredible day at the finish with the X and all that and the pouring rain and the wind yes I remember that that stage like it was it was one of the probably the, one of the best days of, of the of, one of the of the Nissan Classics uh, it was a very difficult day. Started up in Limerick and out uh, at Limerick to Tip Ray Road, and I remember it was you know it was blowing the wind. It was unbelievable and rain, and everybody was very nervous because of the wind. And 
the race started going faster and faster because everybody wanted to be in the front and eventually like we were only two miles out the road and we were just belting for it and uh, into Tipperary and up the Glen of Ahalo and uh, there was you know the bunch was scattered all over all over the Glen of Ahalo and then you know onto onto the V and those riders just got back on before the V and they were out again uh, when we started climbing the V and you know it was it poured rain all the day right into Cork and then I arrived I got away on the way to Cork with Yates and um, you know it was for me it was uh, it was one of the great I think it was one of the great days of my career uh, getting to Patrick's Hill and up oh, Patrick's Hill and as I said the crowd was there and in the pouring rain they were out there and there's thousands and thousands and uh, you know I went on to win that Nissan which is you know uh, which is one of, one of one of the great memories of my career. Here are the men of the moment. This is Sean Yates in second, and Sean Kelly leading them up Patrick's Hill for the very last time in this Nissan International Classic of 1991. Is this one of the great climbs of cycling? Nobody in Cork today is going to disagree with you. Let's go back on the last approach to the finish. Let me quickly remind you of the overall situation. Uh, Sean Kelly and Sean Yates are separated on time by a single second. And Yates has got to win this race by two seconds, George, to be in yellow tonight. Otherwise, it's Kelly. They're giving no respect at all to the greasy surface. They're into the home straight. Sean Yates is in first. Kelly has got the advantage now in second place. He can see the banner. Now, can Sean Kelly finish it off with a flourish and take yellow at the stage? Yates has found fresh legs from somebody. Looks across at Kelly and goes again. Sean Yates is going to spoil Sean Kelly's stage win. But Kelly's reward was another yellow jersey and a fourth Nissan victory. Sadly, the race has now ended, and Kelly was planning his last event too. Last year, when I decided, uh, you know, I was going to have a retirement race, and there had always been a Christmas hamper race, which was, uh, which was a killer of event for last years because there were so many guys training for it. And it was a handicap event, and it was, you know, it, it would tear the chest out at that time of year. So I decided last year, I rode a race in Switzerland with the Roman Joe Classic. And it was the same event as we had in Carrick, and I said, "Well, we'll you know, we'll do something like this, and uh, we'll try and get some of the professionals over." And I started started talking to the professionals, Merckx and Eno, and I had a list of guys, and you know, I, you know, I started ringing about, and as I started ringing, like everyone wanted to come, and in the end, I had to stop because we just couldn't afford it to get everybody over expense-wise. Um, so there's a lot of guys I would have liked to have and would have come, but I just, you know, I just we, we hadn't the budget to get them over. Uh, but it was, you know, an amazing day and uh, the number of riders, over 1,200 riders and uh, the amount of people that came out, it was, it was just a perfect ending for, for a career. On a wonderful day in December in 1994, they all turned up. From world champions to the club cyclist, this was a peloton for everybody. A chance to say I rode against the great Sean Kelly and to say a simple thank you to one of Ireland's best ever sportsmen. This race was not fixed either, but the winner couldn't have been anyone else but Kelly. He went for the line like it was a Milan San Remo or a Tour of Lombardy. An Irish cycling legend, the sport would be the sadder without Sean Kelly. He was more than a rider, he was an entertainer everyone could attach to. On a day you bought a new car, you would remember it because it would be the day Kelly had won Milan San Remo or Paris-Roubaix. How did he see himself among the elite? Well, I think it's very hard to... Uh rate yourself with the others because Max, I think he was in a different he was in a different time for me as a different generation and you know now we're probably going into a different a different generation again so it's very you know it's very hard to compare on the all-time grades you can't really compare my uh, my career with Max's because you know he was he, he was a long long time before me but you know I I look back and you know I started out I knew nothing about cycling when I started riding a bike and uh, I worked on it very hard, I put a lot of work into it, but I got a lot out of it. I made a lot of friends, financially I did well, learned a couple of languages, and uh, you know, made, I've, I have a lot of results there, won a lot of big races, and um, so that's, you know, uh, if I give myself personally, it was very satis it gave me a lot of satisfaction, and I think, you know, a lot of people got an enormous amount of enjoyment out of it, so you know, I have no regrets. If I could go put back the put back the clock and go back and do it all again, I certainly would. Um, there'd be things I'd do probably differently, but uh, on the whole, I would go back and do the whole lot over again.